Okay, should we start or should we wait one minute? As you wish. <clears throat> well, maybe we just start. Uh, so, welcome everybody to the third night of um, of the jazz festival. <laughs> we we just learned that it's four o'clock in the morning in Manila. Uh, so I should uh, feel lucky that it's only nine in the evening here in Barcelona. Uh, so uh, the first talk is Helle, who will continue with her lecture series on co-algebras and their modal logics. Please, Helle. Thank you, Joachim. Yes, so we are at the part two today, which will be about modal logic for co-algebras indeed. So uh, since I'm not sure everyone is familiar, well, I have a background in, in modal logic, I, I thought I'd just give a brief, uh, let's say, a context uh, for, the, for the, let's say, the starting point of, of the work in co-algebraic modal logic. So modal logic really originated in a philosophical logic, uh, and uh, it was introduced to reason about modalities of truth. So in order to reason about notions like uh, a formula phi is necessarily true or phi is possibly true, uh, yeah, formal logics were introduced uh, uh, to this end, and uh, also modal logics for reasoning about deontic or temporal, epistemic, or doxastic notions have and are still uh, being studied in uh, philosophical logic. But modal logic was really adopted uh, into computer science as a, as a, uh, uh, as a tool in formal verification. Uh, because it turned out that modal logics often were able to express uh, the properties that uh, we were interested in, uh, well, in expressing about uh, various systems and, uh, and um, data or knowledge representation. So here's a long list, and if you're familiar with them, uh, great. If not, uh, don't worry about it. It's mainly to give you an impression of, of the scope and variety of modal logics that are uh, being used in, uh, in computer science. And uh, the main reason why they have become so popular is that indeed they have a good trade-off between their expressive power, so the ability to express what we think of as relevant properties for, for uh, the purpose of uh, verifying um, software, and their complexity. So uh, often the decision problems are, well, decidable first of all, so many modal logics are decidable in, in p-space, uh, or if you add fixed points, you need to go a bit higher and you will end up in uh, exponential uh, time. But unlike, well, you can already say, well, we have first order logic, why don't we just use that? We are all very familiar with uh, specifying uh, properties in first order logic. Well, you don't have a decidable uh, <laughs> a satisfiability problem. So that would be, would be one reason. So modal logics are suitable for automated verification. That's the main uh, as a main motivation for their use in, in computer science. Okay, so basically today I want to continue this, uh, well, this story about, well, co-algebra, and I want, want to again place it in the context of uh, algebra. So you all know, of course, uh, equational logic, and equational logic is really, you could say, the logic of, of algebraic reasoning. It's where you have, a, you know, a, a, a rule, like the congruence rule, you reason from the parts you can compose them and then you can make a statement about the, the say the composed uh, object that you get. Now we have a slogan uh, that was phrased by in a paper yeah phrased in a paper from 2011 <clears throat> and that is that modal logic is to co-algebra what equational logic is to algebra. So in other words you can really say that modal logics are co-algebraic. There's a fundamental relationship between modal logics and co-algebra that mirrors that of equational logic to uh, algebra. So that's where we're going. Uh, so here's an overview. So after this introduction, I will first, uh, well, give some, a, a very quick review of a basic modal logic, which some of you may know. So basic modal logic over Kripke frames. And uh, I will also briefly mention neighborhood semantics because it's a nice and well interesting example from a co-algebraic uh, perspective. And then I will go into the main part, which is about uh, co-algebraic modal logic. And there are two main approaches, one via predicate liftings, one via relation liftings. And then I will, will also mention some of the extensions and, and, and indeed some of the results that have been achieved in this uh, co-algebraic uh, framework. Okay, so basic modal logic. <clears throat> 
what is the starting point of all of this? Well, first of all, we, uh, well, we have to say what is a modal uh, language actually. So what are the formulas that, uh, that we have in our uh, logics? Well, typically they are constructed from a set of atomic propositions together with your favorite Boolean connectives and then indeed modalities. So in basic model logic, you have the box and the diamond, or sometimes you only have the box and the diamond is de defined as the Boolean dual or, or vice versa. But uh, these, are, yeah, these are the typical symbols you'll see for uh, modalities. And uh, this language is uh, interpreted over Kripke models. So a Kripke model is just a set with a relation on that set. We think of this set as a, a set of possible worlds. And the, the, the relation can therefore be thought of as, a, as an accessibility relation. So if you are in a, in, in a given world, then the, this, the other states that to which you are related, you think of them as, as a possible alternatives to your current world. That's kind of the philosophical, philosophical idea behind uh, the introduction of, of Kripke semantics. Uh, now, in order to interpret the atomic propositions, we also need to have what we call evaluation. So that's just a function that for every atomic proposition tells us uh, in which states uh, this atomic proposition is, is true. So now we can define the truth of modal formulas in a Kripke model. And it's just done inductively in, in a way that you uh, probably already uh, uh, expect. So uh, we say that a, an atomic, oops, an atomic proposition is true at a state x in the model, precisely when uh, x is in the valuation of uh, the atomic proposition. Now, all the Boolean connectives are defined exactly as you would expect. Namely, well, not phi is true if and only if it is not the case that phi is true, etc. And the interesting part is, of course, when we get to the uh, modalities. So box phi is true at x, if and only if, in all states that are accessible from x, so in all states y that are accessible from x, the formula phi is true. So in other words, phi, box phi is true if all successors of x satisfy phi. Now, dually, the diamond is true at a state x, so diamond phi is true at x, if and only if there is a successor that satisfies phi. Okay, and it's not too difficult to see that indeed this shows that the, the box and the diamond are Boolean uh, jewels of each other. All right, so um, last time we saw the notion of bisimulation for deterministic uh, automata. Now, in fact, bisimulations were invented, uh, well, I think they were invented first or at least independently in, in modal logic, in fact, in the, in the 70s. Uh, as, a, as a tool basically to study the expressiveness of, uh, of modal languages. So they were also independently discovered in, uh, in, uh, in the area of process algebra and concurrency. Um, but, uh, well, I will give you here the, the formulation as uh, it is standardly uh, presented in, uh, in, uh, yeah, in modal logic. So a bisimulation between two uh, Kripke models is a relation between the state spaces such that if you have a pair that is in the relation, so if a pair, you have x1, x2 being in the relation, then first of all, they must satisfy the same atomic propositions. So the idea is, of course, that we are going to get that two states are bisimilar if, if they are, let's say, observationally equivalent. So of course, we cannot have a failure already at the atomic propositional level. The two states need to satisfy the same atomic uh, propositions. Now, we also need to somehow make sure that, that in terms of transitions or successors, we also cannot really distinguish the two states. So if uh, you have a successor y1 of uh, x1, then there must be a successor y2 of x2, such that again, the y1 and the y2 are in the relation. Okay, so you can imagine here you have, oops, you have x1, you have x2, and you want to claim that they are uh, in the relation. So if x1 has some successor y1, then also x2 must have a successor y2 such that they are again in the relation. And the back condition is just, uh, well, starting from the other side, right? If x2 has a successor y2, then also x1 must have a successor y1 such that uh, y1 and y2 are in the relation. 
Okay. Now, uh, we also have a notion of morphisms for crypto frames that was well introduced long before algebra. <laughs> you probably see where this is going, yeah? but a bounded morphism is a function, uh, well, between the model, so from uh, M1 to M2 on the state spaces, right? So a function on the state spaces, uh, such that the graph of that um, function is a bi-stimulation. So in other words, bounded morphisms are functional bi-stimulations between uh, models. Now I will again use some notation, which is basically the same I used uh, last time. So I write, uh, I use this notation here to say that two states are uh, bisimilar, meaning they are linked by some bisimulation. And I will also use this notation here to say that uh, two states are uh, modally equivalent or that they satisfy the same formulas. Okay, so of course where we are headed is that indeed modal truth is by simulation invariant. So, the, well, the theorem says that if two states are by similar, then they satisfy the same formula. So this is also what we would, well, this is in other words saying that the, the, the language, the modal language is, is not too expressive. Right? If we have two states that we really consider to be uh, behaviorally indistinguishable, which by similarity witnesses, then they also satisfy the same formula. The modal language cannot distinguish uh, the two states. Now you can prove this by a, by a straightforward uh, structural induction on, on the formula phi, but I'll show, well, it will be shown at, 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 a, say, at the level of uh, co-algebra uh, later in, in this talk. Okay. So uh, this fundamental relationship between bisimilarity and the modal language uh, goes even further. So you can translate modal logic into a first order logic. So that means we have actually have to do two things, right? We have to translate the modal formulas into a first order language. And we also have to translate the Kripke models into a first order model. But the latter is easy. Yeah? We can just take a Kripke model. It consists of, well, relations and atomic propositions. The atomic propositions we can just view as, well, as unary predicates, and then we have a relation symbol in addition. So that part is easy. And in order to translate the, the formulas, uh, yeah, you can, you can kind of imagine what it would be like when you look at the semantics of the, of the modalities. So again, it's, a, it's an inductively defined um, translation. And it's, uh, it's indexed by a variable V, because if you think about it, modal logic is, is interpreted locally, right? We interpret it locally at a state, uh, well, X, let's say. So that's why the translation also has this local perspective. So it, it somehow always refers to the state where we intend to uh, evaluate the formula. So the translation of uh, an atomic proposition, small p, relative to well, some state variable v is just a p applied to v, right? So this would be true if, if indeed v uh, satisfies uh, p. For the Boolean connectives, it's just uh, done inductively. And then when you get to, the, to a modality, you will see that uh, box, the translation of box phi is well saying that for all u, so the u is the successor of v, uh, the translation of phi is true at u. And similarly for the diamond, uh, the translation of the diamond phi is just saying, well, essentially what the semantics of the modality uh, is saying, namely that there is a U such that U is a successor of V and the translation of uh, phi holds. So now you can show uh, also quite easily uh, that for all Kripke models M indeed and all modal formulas phi, uh, phi is true with respect to the modal semantics at X, if and only if, when I take the model and view it as a first order model, then the standard translation of phi under the assignment that sends V to X is true in the first order model uh, M1. So M1 is just M, but viewed as a first order model. Okay, so one of the, let's say, fundamental results in modal logic is what is called the von Bentham theorem. And it basically says that modal logic is precisely the bi-simulation invariant fragment of first order logic. So in one direction, it's clear, right? So if you have two states that are bi-similar, then they satisfy uh, 
well, they satisfy the same uh, formulas. And um, uh, sorry, yes, so the, sorry, what am I saying? So yeah, if you have two states that are, um, um, sorry, if you have a modal formula, then it is of course invariant for bi-simulation, right? This is what the previous theorem uh, that we saw in the previous slide is saying. Now the converse direction is of course the more interesting one. And that says that if you have a first order formula that is invariant for bi-stimulation, meaning that if you have two states that are bi-similar, and well, for all states that are bi-similar, the formula will be true at one if and only if it is true at the other. But this is now first order formula, right? So we don't really know whether it came from a, a modal formula, but the theorem then says that in fact, then this first order formula is equivalent to the translation of a modal formula. So in that sense, modal logic is really the bi-simulation invariant fragment of uh, first order logic. Okay. So what uh, is not, well, you may already have seen where this is going. So uh, one easy observation is that uh, Kripke frames so a Kripke model consists of a set, a relation and evaluation, right? If you just forget about the valuation, you have what we call a, a Kripke frame. So a set and a relation. And it's easy to see that a relation, you can just, well, you can write it in a different form. Namely, you can write it as a map of this type. So you just say for every, well, for every element, what, are, what is the set of uh, its uh, successors? So we see now that a Kripke frame is just, uh, it's just a co-algebra for the power set functor. And uh, you can then also just simply write out the definition of co-algebra morphism and co-algebra bi-stimulation that you saw last time. And you will find that it exactly corresponds to uh, Kripke bi-stimulation and, uh, and bounded morphism that I introduced at the, at the previous slides. So the co-algebraic modeling of Kripke frames is really, it is, yeah, it's a perfect match with the, with the, the the notions that have already been, uh, been uh, let's say, studied and, and defined in the, in the classic uh, modal logic literature. And another thing to notice is that uh, the, the power set functor preserves weak pullbacks. So this is nice. So that means that over P coalge paths, over clip frames, a behavioral equivalence coincides with the bisimilarity. So that's also one way you can say uh, why uh, in the classic modal logic literature, you, well, we, there was only ever one notion. There was only ever bisimilarity because, uh, well, it just coincides with the, with the notion of behavioral equivalence. Okay. So uh, when we think about all the many applications we have uh, of uh, modal logics, then you will see that sometimes Kripke semantics is actually not uh, suitable. So one situation where, where, well, where this happens is if, for example, you uh, want your modalities to say something about a strategic interaction. So for example, in a game logic by Parikh, introduced by Parikh, the modalities express the strategic ability of players to achieve well, outcomes that satisfy certain formulas in, in, well, in determined two player games. So then box five, will uh, be understood or will, will basically mean that uh, player one has a strategy in some game that I don't specify here, but has a strategy to ensure that the outcome satisfies phi. Now, if you now think about it, the following action here is Kripke valid, meaning it's, it is valid in all Kripke frames. Box phi and psi is equivalent with box phi and box psi. And if you think about the Kripke semantics indeed, so the left-hand side says that all my successors satisfy phi and psi. And this is equivalent with saying all my successors satisfy phi and all my successors satisfy psi, right? It's clear that this is, uh, these two are well equivalent over, over Kripke frames. But this is not a valid principle valid principle with respect to the intended interpretation uh, uh, of the box in this setting here as, as an interpretation in, 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 this, uh, in this way. Because it could be that, you know, if you have a strategy for phi and you have a strategy for psi, it could be that these two strategies are conflicting. You may not be able to exercise both of them uh, at the same time so that you would achieve both phi and psi. 
So only, only monotonicity holds. It's certainly the case if you have a strategy to achieve both, then well, then you have strategy to achieve one of them. So the, well, this means of course that uh, we, we don't really want to interpret uh, our language over critical frames because then we would get uh, validities that, uh, that we uh, well, do not consider to be sensible. So the solution is to interpret uh, these modal languages in uh, neighborhood models. So a neighborhood model is, uh, well, is again, a, a set of worlds or state space, and now together with what we call a neighborhood function. So it's a map of this type. So it says for every state uh, X, uh, well, for every state X, it gives us a collection of subsets of the state space. And these subsets we call the neighborhoods of the little state. So you can, of course, many of you are now thinking in terms of topology. And uh, well, indeed, topologies are certain examples of, uh, of neighborhood frames, but we do not require that uh, a little x is also an element of its neighborhoods. The, the neighborhoods could be any subsets uh, of, the, of, the, of the universe in this case. And uh, well, we also need a, a evaluation for the atomic propositions. But uh, the, the, the way we interpret modalities in such a neighborhood model is then to say that, well, box phi, if box is the symbol we're using, is, uh, is true at a state X, if not only if the truth set, so the set of states where phi is true, uh, is a neighborhood of X. And now you can, well, now you can, now it's not difficult to see that you don't get, let's say, uh, this axiom for free. This will not be a valid uh, principle over all neighborhood frames. Okay, yeah, so indeed I see some <laughs> mentions in the chat. So indeed you will see now that this it was maybe not so good to use this P here because we can also view neighborhood structures as core algebras, but indeed we view them as core algebras for the contravariant powers that forms are composed with itself. So I should have, that was because I didn't introduce the Q yet here, but it would have been better to write Q here. But indeed, Neighborhood frames are co-algebras for the, well, what we call the neighborhood functor, which is just Q composed with itself. And if you work out what, what the morphisms are, well, it's just doing Q twice, so you take inverse image uh, twice. So you see, I mean, in terms of types, uh, it's clear that this, uh, this works. And uh, if you look at the literature of, uh, of, of well, the, the work that has been done on neighborhood semantics, you will see also that the notion of morphism will then correspond to, uh, to the notions that, uh, that people have introduced in, in modal logic. And now I mentioned before that uh, we may not have this uh, like distributivity of the box over the conjunction, but we do have monotonicity. And that means that often we're interested in not all neighborhood frames, but only the ones that are monotonic, meaning that the neighborhood collections are closed onto supersets. So that's what we, uh, well, we, uh, we define this uh, monotone neighborhood functor, which is just the sub functor of the neighborhood functor that is restricted to all the upwards closed uh, subsets, uh, upset, sorry, upset closed uh, collections of neighborhoods. And uh, now it's important to notice that uh, these two neighborhood functors, both, uh, both the N and the monotonic uh, version, they do not preserve weak pullbacks. And, in fact, in the beginning of, uh, of co algebra, so in Jan's uh, universal co algebra paper, he assumed weak pullback preservation for many results because at the time it was thought that actually all the, all the examples we're interested in are for functions that uh, preserve weak pullbacks. But uh, these are well, well motivated examples of co algebra that, uh, that uh, well, do not have this, uh, where well, the functor does not have this uh, property. So this means in particular that we can find actually very small models, finite models where you have states that are uh, uh, behaviorally equivalent, but they are not uh, bisimilar in the co algebraic sense, uh, if you instantiate the definition of, of bisimilarity from, uh, that you saw last time. Okay, so I also introduced, and I, I wanted to mention neighborhood semantics because it's also an interesting application of co algebra. So the notion of bisimulation, as I mentioned, was already found well ad hoc in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, yeah, in the concurrency community and modal logic community. And same for probabilistic systems. Uh, notions of bisimulations have been, have been invented without uh, any knowledge of, of co algebra. And then it turns out that they do coincide with the co algebraic notion. But for neighborhood semantics, uh, 
well, this is a different story. So Nebold semantics has, has been around since uh, the 70s. In the beginning, there was very little model theory, certainly no notion of morphism and bisimulation, only much later for monotonic Nebold frames. Uh, von Benham and, and uh, Mark Powell introduced a notion of bisimulation. But it was still very unclear what a notion of bisimulation for neighborhood frames that you don't assume to be monotonic uh, would be. And uh, together with Clemens Kupke and Eric Packett, I, uh, well, I basically applied the core algebraic uh, framework in order to instantiate uh, the definition. Because, I mean, the general definition is, is, well, it's easy to understand, but when you actually instantiate it to something concrete in order to reformulate it into something that is, let's say, a useful, uh, concrete definition. It's not always trivial, but uh, well, we did this, and indeed, what comes out is uh, is not exactly something that you would have thought of. Uh, let's say it would it would not have been so easy to find it in an ad hoc uh, way. So yeah, nice application of of algebra, I think. And uh, yeah, once you then have a notion of bias simulation, then you can think about proving results like what we call Hennessy Milner theorems. So showing that not only uh, is truth invariant for bisimulation, but also vice versa. If you have two states that are satisfying the same formulas, then you can show that they are in fact uh, already well behaviorally equivalent. It would have to be in this case under certain finite finiteness uh, restrictions. If your language is also has only finite uh, conjunctions. Anyway, this uh, this was a little uh, aside, so I'm not going to talk more about these results for now. Uh, we will see them in in at, in greater generality uh, later on. Anyway. Okay, so uh, now I want to go to the main part of the of the talk, so quadratic model logic, and um, well, the general aim is uh, to have well to develop model logics for T core algebras that are well developed uniformly and parametric in the in the font of T that uh, specifies the type of transitions and observations, etc., that uh, that you have in your system. And it should be adequate with respect to the core algebraic semantics. So meaning that indeed, if two states are behaviorally equivalent, then they should satisfy the same formula. So we want to, to have a framework that is, let's say, sound with respect to the core algebraic uh, semantics as well. We don't want the language to be too uh, expressive. And uh, yeah, I should just mention now in this whole talk, my, my, my core algebra function will be called T, not F. Uh, last time I, I used F because I wanted to reserve T for monads, but now, Monads will not play a separate role, so I'm going to use T for the for the core algebra type functor throughout. And now, as I mentioned, there are two main approaches to uh, core algebraic model logic. One is via relation lifting, and one is via predicate lifting. And I'm going to focus on the predicate lifting uh, part because it's the one that most closely re resembles, or let's say, generalizes the the situation that uh, we have from from basic model logic, and it has inspired much of the work in in uh, core algebraic model logic. Uh, at the end, if I have time, I will also explain how the relation lifting approach uh, works. But the basic idea of the predicate lifting approach is that, well, as a slogan, you can say that core algebraic model logic is to T core algebras what basic model logic is to critical frames. So what happens if you replace this P with some arbitrary functor T? What kind of logic can you develop up here? And which kind of results can you can you then prove already at this uh, well at this level of uh, of generality? Okay, so um, maybe I should first point out that when we say core algebraic model logic, what we mean is core algebraic semantics of modal languages. So the the languages themselves are not well are not modal are not core algebraic themselves. So we have a language in mind. And then we want to interpret that language over, over core algebras. So uh, yeah, the way one usually starts uh, is that you assume that you have some modal signature. So you have some collection of modal operators with the arities. And uh, usually you base yourself over just Boolean propositional logic. So you take your favorite Boolean connectives again, and you add some modalities. So this is just a, a straightforward generalization of the basic uh, model la language that you saw before. And we allow the, the, the modalities to be uh, to be uh, enary. They don't have to be unary. And uh, well, for notational simplicity, I will often focus on unary ones, but uh, in a few places I will also, um, yeah, sometimes it's actually easier to, to distinguish things when you take in the, the, the arbitrary arities. But in any case, uh, generalization to n modalities is uh, straightforward. 
So uh, we want to interpret these uh, formulas that we have now in this language over, well, T co-algebra essentially, but uh, we also have these atomic propositions around. So you can think of the T co, you can think of a T co-algebra model as a, well, a T co-algebra together with a valuation. But you can also just combine the valuation and the, the T co-algebra part into a T times power set of prop co-algebra. And yeah, sometimes I will, I will not really make a, be very explicit about this uh, distinction because sometimes it's easier to just give a definition for T co-algebras. And if you already pack the atomic propositions into your T, then uh, well, everything will, will work out as you intend. But if you view, the, view your critical models or co-algebraic models, let's say as T times prop co-algebras, then the atomic propositions are just, uh, well, modal constants basically. So that's the only thing that, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention. Okay. So um, let's uh, briefly revisit uh, Kripke and the uh, neighborhood semantics again to see how we get to this more general notion of, of uh, pred predicate lifting. So if you recall the semantics of the, of the box modality in, in a Kripke model is basically saying that the set of successors, so box four is true at X, if the set of successors of X is a subset of the set of states that satisfy phi, right? Box phi says all my successors satisfy phi. So, well, it's the same as saying the set of success successors is a subset of, of uh, the true set of phi. And similarly, the diamond, uh, uh, diamond phi is true at X if and only if the set of successors has a non empty intersection with, uh, with the true set of phi. Okay, so writing this slightly differently is same as saying that the, the, the set of successors or R of X belongs to, well, some collection of subsets that have that specified property. Now for neighborhood semantics, uh, well, it's, we can do a similar thing, right? So box phi is true at, at X, if and only if, well, the true set of phi is a neighborhood. And this is, well, another way of saying that is that the, the, the N of X of the neighborhood collection at X must belong to, well, the set of all neighborhood collections that have that, uh, that property. So this is kind of the general, uh, let's say, shape of the condition. So when we talk about our, our well, co-algebraic modalities, uh, we're looking for some, well, some predicate on, on, the, on these generalized successors, gamma X, right? That, that would be intuitively what a, what a modality should, uh, should, uh, should say. So, formally, uh, we do this by uh, interpreting the modalities with uh, certain natural transformations. So, a T algebraic semantics consists of, well, first of all, you have to say what are the structures that you want to interpret uh, your formulas in. So, what are the, well, what is the T? And then for every modality or model operator, uh, you have to provide uh, an interpretation, which is a natural transformation from the Contravariant power set functor to the contravariant power set functor composed with the type functor. So, uh, in other words, now I'm, I'm giving the diagram here because the Q is contravariant, so you need to swap the arrows. So it's maybe handy to see. In other words, this uh, this semantics of the of the modality is uh, well, it's a it's a family of set index map set indexed maps such that for all functions f from x to y, the following diagram here uh, converges. So this is what we call a predicate lifting. And it's called a predicate lifting because it takes a subset of X, right? A predicate over X and it lifts it to a subset of T of X. So in other words, a predicate over T of X. And now, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, giving too many, many uh, so I'm not, I'm not gonna say too much about the special case of, uh, of polynomial functors. And this is also partly because I think Bart Jacobs may, uh, may go into that in, in uh, his talk next. So in fact, if you have uh, what we call Kripke polynomial set functors, so functors that you can build from the, well, the polynomial constructs as well as the Kripke, Kripke functor, the covariant power set functor, then you can actually define predicate liftings inductively also over the structure of the functor. Uh, this is not, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's also described in, in Bart's book if you are interested in, in seeing how this works, but I think he may also explain it in, in his talks. That's why I didn't want to uh, go too much into it here. 
Okay, so uh, what is nice about these predicate liftings? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to briefly finish the story about the semantics. So, uh, given given such a algebraic semantics, we can then define the truth of modal formulas in uh, in uh, in T models, and uh, of course, it works uh, well. It, it works inductively in the way as before, and the only case that is different is indeed the the modal case. So now, well. We use the predicate lifting to interpret uh, this uh, hard phi. We use hard phi because we don't want to, well, we don't want to, um, as I suggest, that it is something like a box which has a universal flavor or a diamond which has a, 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 um, an existential flavor. But this modality phi, so hard phi, is true at x if and only if uh, gamma x, so indeed the kind of generalized successor, the core algebra successor, uh, belongs to the lifted predicate. So if you lift the predicate phi with your, with your predicate lifting, then you get a subset of T of X. And if gamma X is in that subset, then the formula is true and otherwise not. Okay, so now indeed we see that for the Kripke uh, modalities and the neighborhood modalities, the, the predicate liftings are, well, are, are just the ones here that you would, uh, you would also expect. Okay, so um, yeah, what is now nice about this, uh, this uh, well, definition in terms of, uh, of the semantics in terms of predicate liftings is that we can prove uh, adequacy or truth and variance at the college bike level. So in other words, for all T college bar morphisms, so from one T college bar to another, yeah, uh, X and F of X will satisfy the same modal formulas. Uh, put differently for all modal formulas phi, the true set of phi in X is exactly the inverse image on, under F of the true set in, uh, in, in Y. And from this, since we know that indeed behavioral equivalence is uh, obtained by uh, you know, having a co-span of uh, morphisms, it follows that if two states are behaviorally equivalent, then they also satisfy the same formulas. Now the proof of this proposition is, uh, is again by structural induction on phi. And uh, when you get to the uh, uh, inductive uh, induction step for the model case, you use the commutativity of this, uh, this diagram here. So uh, it's a, just a neat little uh, application of, uh, of uh, well, some very basic category theory. And basically the lower part here uh, commutes because of naturality of, uh, of uh, your predicate lifting here. And the upper part here commutes because it is essentially just uh, uh, the, the contravariant powers that forms are applied to the uh, homomorphism diagram for F. So if you, you assume that F is a T called homomorphism, so then the, well, if you would imagine what it looks like without having applied the, the contravariant powers that form to you, see that uh, this is because F is a called homomorphism. Well, with Q applied to it, so to speak. So the commutativity of this diagram uh, says that indeed for all little x and all uh, subsets uh, u uh, up to un, uh, gamma x is in the lifted predicate of the inverse uh, images of the use if and only if the delta of f of x, so the algebra successor in the, in the, in the y algebra, so to speak, is in the lifted predicate. And that's exactly what you need in order to show the inductive step of the, of the proposition. Okay, so we've shown truth and variance at the, at the level of algebras. Now, uh, another intuition or another way of looking at these predicate liftings is uh, by applying the Yoneda lemma. So if you, uh, well, from the Yoneda lemma, we know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between predicate liftings and subsets of T applied to two to the N. Okay. And there is actually a nice kind of intuition behind this. Namely, you can think of predicate liftings as being, let's say, classes of allowed zero one patterns. So if you think of a formula or a collection of formulas, uh, if you have uh, phi up to phi one up to phi n, uh, you can think of them as defining uh, some kind of coloring on your state space. So if you think of this part here as for every state you, you assign some some colors from the, from the, the phi's. The phi's can say either, well, zero or one, and you think of this as some color that is assigned to, a, to your state space. 
Now you can, of course, uh, apply your T and get the, the lower part here, right? You can apply T to this coloring map. And uh, that means you will get something that you can think of as a T structure, a colored T structure, right? So if, for example, if your T was the, was the functor for, um, for binary trees, you know, you, you know your, your tree would look something like this. I'm not very good at drawing here. Uh, and then inside, okay, let's for simplicity assume that we have just one formula, right? So this phi will, will assign, depending on whether it's true or false at the, at the north, it, you'll have zeros and ones inside, uh, here, inside your tree here, right? Et cetera. And uh, so that's something that, uh, that, that lives here, so to speak. And now your model C, if you think of it as the characteristic function associated with this uh, subset, will then say whether that pattern is accepted or not by the modality. So in that sense, yeah, we can think of the modalities as, as, a, as a subsets of a zero one patterns uh, of, of T structures. Okay, so, um, Another, well, another application of this uh, unit of correspondence is that it also tells us how many predicate liftings there are in fact. So for instance, for the, for the covariant power set functor, uh, we can say, well, if, if N is one, uh, so we're dealing with unary predicate liftings, then you'll see, well, there are two to the power P of two unary predicate liftings. So that's 16 uh, unary predicate liftings uh, in total. And uh, well, you can, you can, you can, of course, figure out that some of them are not that interesting or not that expressive. Some of them are basically just saying like, I have no successor or I have, I have some successor. Um, but the, yeah, the, the ones for the, the diamond and the box are, are, are special in a sense. Uh, that's a different, uh, well, I, I get to that, but uh, the, basically you ins one way of say seeing it is that they generate all of the predicate liftings by Boolean combinations. But if you think in terms of these zero one patterns, the box is the one that corresponds to the subset uh, singleton one of, uh, of power set of two, because it says that all the, all the successors I see uh, make phi true. I only see ones, let's say from the formula phi in my set of successors. And the diamond, well, the diamond is, uh, it, it allows you to, well, you have to see at least one, so uh, you could either see, uh, well, one, one, or you could see, um, um, well, a, a zero and a one, so to speak. Both, both are allowed. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, this intuition, I think, is also, is also quite nice. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so it was, it was mentioned in, 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 in earlier papers by, by uh, Lutz Schroeder and uh, was by Peter Kumar. Could not rem remember the year here, I'm afraid. All right, so we are in, well, we saw the adequacy can be proved in full generality, but the converse uh, direction of, of that statement, so namely if two states are modally equivalent, so if two states satisfy the same formulas, are they then also behaviorally equivalent? That's something that doesn't hold in general. That will not always hold, but if it holds, then we say that your logic is uh, expressive. And you can think about conditions on your, on your modalities for having a, an expressive logic. And uh, the following condition here was, uh, well, was uh, described by, by Dirk Patzenson. And it's, uh, well, we call it a set, like to have a separating set of uh, predicate liftings. So if you have your collection of predicate liftings uh, here on the semantics of your predicate uh, of your modalities, then we say that it is separating if whenever you have two elements that are different in T of X, then there has to be some lifting and some predicates such that the lifted predicate separates the two. So T of one is in the lifted predicate uh, and T of two is not or, or vice versa. So that's when we say that a collection of predicate lifting, liftings is a separating. And you can see that this is a local condition. This is what you can think of as a one-step condition. It's a local condition on the, 
on, on the semantics of the of the modalities. It's not we don't need to look at the entire language in order to already determine this. But if you have such a, a separating uh, set of uh, predicate liftings, and if your function t is finitary, then uh, it follows that your language is uh, is expressive. And now you can then think uh, even further. But well, th there's something that is maybe not so nice that you have to like find this <laughs> this lambda. Uh, as we saw before, there could be a lot of them, right? So could we maybe find a condition on the functor alone that guarantees the existence of a, a set of separating uh, predicate liftings? And in fact, uh, well, we can. So Le Schröder showed that if your functor t is finitary, then there is a separating set of predicate liftings. It, they may not be unary. You, you may need higher arities, but you can always find a set of separating, separating predicate liftings. And the, well, by the previous theorem, that means that you also have an expressive uh, module logic. Let's see, okay, I don't have much time, okay. So, uh, yes. So I, briefly, I wanted to uh, also uh, explain the, the, the relation lifting approach. So the basic idea is that uh, now your language has only one canonical modality. So as, as before we saw with the predicate lifting approach, it, it could be a bit arbitrary which modalities you choose. So in, in this way, the relation lifting approach is, is maybe nicer because you just have one canonical modality, but it's a bit of a strange modality. Uh, so it takes as arguments uh, elements of T applied to the set of formulas. And the, well, the semantics of this modality is then defined via lifting of the satisfaction relation. So if you think of this, uh, well, truth relation or satisfaction relation as a relation between states and formulas, uh, then we can define the truth of uh, Nabla alpha, where alpha is indeed something from T uh, of, of L, where L is the set of formulas. Then Nabla alpha is true at X in a core algebra, if and only if, when you lift the satisfaction relation with this T bar. So the relation lifting associated with a T that we also saw last time, this is called the bar lifting, this one. If you look in this lifted relation, then you will find gamma X and alpha, right? So alpha came from T of L, gamma comes from T of X. So type-wise, it's fine, right? And if you indeed find this pair in your lifted relation, then uh, Nabla alpha is, uh, is true. Now, uh, one, uh, let's say, drawback of this approach is that in order to show adequacy for this uh, modal logic, you need to assume that T preserves weak pullbacks. So you can see that immediately rules out the neighborhood semantics that we saw earlier as being treated in this, uh, in this framework. There are ways of kind of repairing this, but I, I'm not able to work, go into the details with this now. Uh, a nice thing is this Nabla logic, like if, if, well, if the functor indeed preserves weak pullback, so if you have the say, conditions for, for having the logic at all, then it's always expressive. And indeed the language is uh, canonical, but it is a, a bit non-standard. So I, at least I find it very unintuitive to, to think of this Nabla uh, modality for, for, for various uh, functors. So one example, and also where it has been explored uh, already, is uh, is for the covariant power set functor indeed, where this bar lifting. So the bar lifting of the contra of the covariant power set functor is also known as the Eckley Milner lifting, and uh, it is basically the following that you see uh, here, and you will recognize here the by simulation conditions. Right. So if you remember, by sim by simulations were also defined as post fixed points of this operator that was defined in terms of this relation lifting. And now you see where this comes from, the back and forth uh, condition. Um, so if you write out what, uh, what the, let's say, the Nabla means for the, for the covariant power set functor. So in this case, you would, well, instead of alpha, I wrote here uh, big phi because it's a set of formulas. Uh, then Nabla big phi will hold at a, a state X if and only if. Now you look, what does it, what does it mean? to have the, you know, the, the phi uh, uh, related to the set of successors of X in the lifted relation. Well, it means that all our successor, successors of X satisfy some formula in phi, and for all formulas in phi, there is some uh, success of X that's at which it is satisfied. 
So that means that this uh, big phi is actually equivalent with the following formula here. So you can express the Nabla phi in terms of, uh, of the box on the diamond. And in fact, this is a more general result. Namely, you can show that for any, like for any algebraic uh, uh, model, or, well, for any functor t that preserves big pullbacks, uh, the Nabla can always be expressed by uh, predicate liftings and, and vice versa. So the two approaches are as a equivalent in the sense that there's nothing you can express with one and not the other, but they, well, they each have, uh, let's say, advantages and, and, and drawbacks. Uh, so, okay, uh, that's all I want to say about the uh, relation liftings. And now time is running out, but I'm almost there. So uh, there are various extensions of the basic uh, algebraic model logic that I've shown you now. So you can think about indeed adding fixed points to get a algebraic uh, mu calculus. This has been studied both for the Nabla version, version and for the predicate lifting version. You can think about temporal extensions, so adding uh, temporal operators. You can think about uh, like a propositional dynamic logic uh, extensions or generalizations, uh, if you're familiar with a uh, PDL from the uh, model logic. And uh, you can also think about like first order uh, versions of, uh, of Kolchberg, first order model logic versions uh, done Kolchbergly. So these have all been, uh, been explored and I will try to include some, some more detailed references uh, later on. And indeed the upshot of having this Kolchberg framework is that many results can also be proved at the Kolchberg level. Of course, this means that in practice, what we do is we identify conditions on the functor and possibly the base category or other things that are needed in order to, to prove the theorem in, 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 uh, at, a higher, at the higher uh, level of generality. And this has been done uh, for a number of, uh, of uh, classic results in, uh, in modal logic, including the von Bentham theorem and also the version, well, the analog of that, you could say for the modal mu calculus, which is the Jeanne Valukiewicz theorem. So for the, in the classic case, it says that the modal mu calculus is the bisimulation and variant fragment of monadic second order logic. And you can generalize that also to the, to the core algebraic level. There's also a, an analog of the Goldblatt Thomason theorem, which is like a modal analog of the Birkhoff variety theorem and various uh, completeness uh, and, uh, and decidability results uh, and, and results on uniform escalation. But I'm running out of time now, so I think I should skip to the last slides. So what I've shown here is kind of the, 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 say the, the starting from the very concrete going, going further towards the, say, the abstract. And for some of you, maybe I should have started from the other end. Maybe I should have just shown you immediately in this picture, which is the, the most abstract view you can have on, well, our current understanding of, of the quarterback model logic, namely in the framework of, of dual adjunctions. So you think of the basic setup you have with your functor T for co-algebras and some uh, functor L on Boolean algebras that specifies basically the model, uh, the model operators in terms of their algebraic semantics. And uh, yeah, then you get this nice setup. So basically the adjunction here at the bottom is what we call a logic, logical connection. And it specifies essentially the satisfaction relation. And you can lift under certain conditions. Well, you can always lift the, 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 the functors. You, you do not always get an adjunction at the top. Uh, but I think Bart will talk about some of the conditions uh, for when, when you do get an adjunction. And if you do get an adjunction, then you get, uh, let's say, you can, exp you can prove uh, expressiveness and uh, completeness uh, in terms of properties of, of this uh, adjunction. Okay, um, yeah, so I think that brings me to the end of my talk. So this is just a summary of, uh, of what I've told you, not only in part two, but uh, I think, well, from my point of view, I think that the, the work on co-algebraic uh, model logic is, uh, or co-algebraic model logic is one of the main contributions of, of uh, co-algebra. I mean, this, this deep understanding that co-algebra and model logic are intrinsically let's say, are, are, are fundamentally uh, connected in the same way uh, as equational logic and, and algebra are, I think is, uh, is a, well, it's a very beautiful uh, insight. And uh, indeed, concretely, it, it manifests itself in this relationship between modal expressiveness and, and, uh, and uh, bisimilarity or behavioral equivalence. Uh, and um, yes, so in terms of polynomial functors, uh, they are, well, they are just, let's say, some functors for which we can consider co but they are indeed very well behaved. 
So they preserve weak pullbacks and they are continuous. So they also have a very nice gorge break theory and, and uh, the model logics, like we can have a Nubli logic, for instance, and we know that also uh, by similarity is, uh, is, a, is a, a complete proof principle for, for behavioral equivalence. So that brings me to the end of the, of the talk. So thank you uh, very much for, for listening. Thanks a lot, Helle. That was uh, really nice. Um, I should have interrupted you uh, five minutes ago, but the second to last slide was too exciting. <laughs> uh, so um, we don't have so much time for questions, but I see that Paul Taylor raised his hand. Um, so let me figure out how to unmute, ask to unmute. Paul, please. Um. Yes, I'll just turn, turn my video on. Um, doesn't seem to work. Um, okay, so so thanks for an interesting talk. Which so you started from modal logic and go, went towards category theory. Um, I'm not sure whether the uh, so my way of thinking is the other way around from that. Um, but it, it suggests um, generalizing a lot of ideas from predicate calculus to category theory to um, to algebras. Now, what you, one thing, a part, aspect of logic you didn't mention was induction, well-founded induction, um, which is something you can do over um, over algebras with the, the notion of well-founded algebra that I introduced. Um, so I've worked done some work on that more recently, um, removing the requirement for, for preserving full weak pullbacks. Um, I'd be interested to see whether you could um, you could give an interpretation of of induction um, for my well-founded co-algebras um, as part of your theory. Yeah, that would be interesting. I, I cannot <laughs> I cannot give you an answer here. Uh, that's uh, that's I'll, for sure. I'll, but... I'll, put the, I'll put the web address in my in the chat. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yes. And so I'm just thinking, so do you think uh, of the, of, yeah, I'm trying to think, so um, are you thinking of capturing it as a, as a, as a proof rule or as a modality or? Um, I, that I don't know. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I have, um, you know, like you, I went from the, the traditional notion of induction and well-foundedness, right? In the induction scheme and well-foundedness and that, and generalized it to co-algebras for functors, um, not only over sets but over quite quite um, um, general kinds of categories, at least mm -hmm. in the recent work. And I'm wondering whether whether you know that seems to be, as it were, parallel to what you've done. Um, with uh, you've you've done the corresponding thing with modal modal logic. Um, I wonder whether you can draw those parallels together and incorporate um, induction into your into your generalized logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, I, I'm just, yeah, I, I'm just typing the typing the web address into the chat and then. Yes. 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 No. I'd be very interested in, in looking into that. So yeah, I, I'm not able to give you a, <laughs> give you an answer. Uh, no, I'm just saying yeah. here's here's an idea for more more work. Yeah. Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we look forward. Uh, if there is a workshop number two, we will love to hear about all that. Um, so I think we have to move on. So uh, let's thank Helle again for these very nice lectures. Thanks. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Yes, please. And then uh, Bart, are you all set? Yes, can you hear me? Can you see my slides now? Yes, but we don't hear you very much. At least I don't. Uh, is it better like this? It's a little bit better, but it's still not uh, too loud, I would say. I'll sit closer then. Is it uh, a bit better like this? Yes. OK. Oh, hang on, I should, uh, should move to the beginning. 
Okay, so you get a very quick view of my talk. Yeah, there I am. <clears throat> should okay. I start? Then I think uh, we should just start. So it's a pleasure to have Bart Jacobs here, who will talk about uh, lifting of polynomial functors for logical reasoning. Please, Bart. Thanks, Jorgen. And also thanks to David for organizing this meeting here and uh, for inviting me to speak to you. I will talk about some classic work. Um, it's uh, work going back to the late 90s, but it's really, I would say, fundamental work on polynomial functors that uh, fits in a workshop like this. But uh, I should say this is more of a tutorial talk and, and uh, the material may be familiar to, to many of you here in the audience, but still uh, I think it's worthwhile to, to have because I think it's exciting, uh, ex exciting material and it's nice to talk about this tonight. It's an exciting night here in the Netherlands. We have election night going on. So I'm, I'm watching with one eye what's going on in the polls and the, the, the uh, outcomes that are appearing now. But for now, I'm, I'm concentrated on this talk. So what's the, <coughs> the topic? Polynomial functors. Hella has already mentioned them uh, a lot. Um, <clears throat> so that's useful, that's good for my talk. And they are uh, uh, specific interpretations of polynomial expressions. Uh, uh, some people in this workshop talk about categories of polynomials and what kind of structure there is. Here it's really polynomials interpreted in, in functor categories. And as I said, it's a, it's a tutorial, it's classic work from the late 90s, and it's on, on polynomial functors and the associated logic. It's not new work, it's actually old work, you could say certainly in this area, more than 20 years uh, old. And it combines two, two topics, two of my favorite topics, uh, which I actually cover in books. One on categorical logic, which, which is very much about vibrations and their theories and their use in, in logic. Another is introduction to core algebra. So what's my own involvement with polynomial, polynomial functors? Well, one, one strand is very much in, in core algebra, the, the style that Hallett talked about. Where, where these polynomial functors end up as the co-domains of, of co-algebras, which capture the, the type of uh, computation involved. And if you, if you uh, open my book from 2016, actually most of the book concentrates on polynomial functors. Uh, uh, you can do co-algebra in general for general functors with certain properties, but in actual examples, it's really, really polynomial functors that you're interested in, and they, they give you the relevant examples and, and the nicer properties to deal with. Also, I'm interested in a, in a more principled approach, uh, uh, especially a logical approach associated with these polynomial functors. And that's the topic of this day uh, today. And I wrote an article on this together with Claudio Amina in 89. Uh, which is basically the content of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, talk. So what are polynomial functors? In formal definitions, uh, endofunctors built up inductively from primitives by a products and coproducts. And uh, there are some, some variations in here. The definition certainly includes identity functors and constant functors, and maybe some special functors like power set list distribution, et cetera, on specific categories, uh, but the, often on sets, but it may also be via two or is functor on a, on a category of topological spaces. Now, the next two properties are very important, as at least in this talk, these functors are close on the products and on the co-products. Uh, there's some, some variation, especially with respect to, to co-products, whether they can be finite or infinite, and here I'll simply look at the, the finite ones. Sometimes people also use closure on the constant exponents, so fx to the power a, where pay, uh, a is an, is an uh, object. Um, often a is a set or a finite set. Uh, if it's a finite set, it's already, in this case, it's already covered by closure on the, on the products. Sometimes also uh, fixed points are included, uh, at least, or, or the largest, greatest fixed points, I will uh, uh, exclude them here. Um, 
um, I will concentrate on this inductive buildup of, the, of these functors. Uh, sometimes they can also be characterized by preservation of structure. For instance, the, the uh, polynomial functors on sets can be characterized as the functors uh, which preserve countable, uh, uh, countable uh, pullbacks and are accessible. Uh, but, but I will concentrate on the structure. And actually, I will concentrate on closure on the finite products and co-products, and those functors are, are often called simple polynomial functors. What are the main points? Well, data types or co-data types in computer science, they appear as initial and final uh, uh, algebras or co-algebras of such polynomial functors when defined on a category of types. And the logical principles for reasoning about these co-data types or data types like induction and, 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 and uh, co-induction, can be described by lifting these functors to, uh, to a logical level. And Hannah already talked uh, uh, about predicate and, and relation lifting, and I'll describe this in a more systematic context here. So these principles are the, the, uh, induction and co-induction, and technically this happens in the context of vibrations, which I'll briefly discuss. And uh, there's an actually a nice mathematical result uh, on it, which is also interesting from a logical perspective that in presence of comprehension and quotients, translated into the categorical logic, induction and co induction holds automatically. I'll, I'll finish with that uh, result. So, what's my running example? Let's uh, take a front of T defined on the category of sets. T of X is L plus X cross X. So L is a fixed set of labels, and you may recognize from this functor, if you're trained a little bit in this, you see certain kinds of trees associated with this functor. So the functor is like a signature for specific trees, and this is the whole idea. And we can look at the initial algebra and the final co-algebra of this, and uh, you may want to think a bit for yourself a little bit more what are initial algebras. Again, if you're trained in this a little bit, it comes up fairly quickly. Initial algebras are the finite L labeled trees, binary L labeled trees, which arise in this way. So an element A forms an element of the tree. And if you have two trees, you can join them together to form an, uh, a new tree in this way. And here are examples. Now, final co algebras <coughs> are both finite and infinite uh, uh, L labeled trees. So you see uh, this one appearing again, but you can also have infinite trees now uh, in this uh, uh, final uh, co-algebra. And this is how these kind of data types are, are used in, in computer science, but also in, in proof uh, systems like Koch, uh, for, uh, for instance. Uh, so what are the explicit uh, constructions? It's, it's nice to, to play a little bit with these kind of things. So if I have A as my initial algebra and the, the algebra map alpha, which is an isomorphism by, by uh, Lombach's uh, lemma, it consists of a co-tuple alpha one, alpha two, then this, this uh, tree of two, uh, two labels, this tree here, can be described by applying alpha one to A and to B. So that is this first part, which are maps, oh, sorry, this is a typo, there should be a plus here. Um, the, uh, the alpha one uh, of A and alpha one of B are trees themselves, and alpha two is the map that joins two trees together to form a new tree. So, and in this way, you can inductively build up a tree corresponding to formation of terms in this initial algebra. Um, let's look at the same tree uh, arising in a final co-algebra description. Um, again, uh, there's a typo here, it should be L plus Z cross Z, where Z is now the final uh, co-algebra, the carry of the final co-algebra. So the, this tree arises as F bar of zero, where F bar is a map uh, which arises in this diagram by finality. So this is the final uh, co-algebra, and here I've written the plus in the right way. And in, uh, in order to define this F bar, I need to define a co-algebra of this form. I'll do it on the three elements set, set 0, 1, 2. And uh, the definition is, is like this. So 
F0 grows to one and two, to go a pair one, two, you continue in this way, F1 goes to A and F2 goes to A. Oh, <clears throat> and this defines the co-algebra here. This map gives the behavior of this co-algebra as, uh, as it's described in this uh, uh, terminology. Its behavior is very, uh, very simple. Zero goes to one, two, which is, which is this split of the, of the tree here. And because this diagram commutes, it's the same going F to here and F bar here and here. And if you go through this, this diagram uh, two more times, you see that this structure arises in, in this way. Okay, so, so, so much for algebras and co-algebras and how they correspond to data types and how you can uh, represent things in there. Let's look at vibrations. Um, and I'll approach this from a rather intuitive uh, uh, perspective. Uh, where I am, it's already late at night, so relax and sit back. I'll, I will not make it too difficult uh, uh, for you and describe the main ideas. Now, the, the uh, concept of the uh, vibration, or sometimes called fiber category, category fibre, uh, I think in French, uh, uh, it, it um, <clears throat> goes back to the 60s in, in work of uh, Grotendieck and, and others. And the idea what they try to capture in a topological uh, set up, a setting, but it can be done much more generally, is the idea of uh, an index set, but then categorically. And let's look at an index set for the moment. So if we have a collection of sets x, y index over some uh, index uh, set i, there are actually two ways to, to describe uh, them. One is, is a function 2i, so a function with codomain i, where you think of the domain as, as, uh, as a disjoint union of, of the, the uh, sets xi that you see, uh, see as being indexed. Or you can describe it as a, as a map to sets, actually formally a functor, where you see i as the discrete uh, uh, category. Now, how do you translate this into, into uh, a category? There are two ways, two similar ways of do this, doing this. Uh, if you want to have a B index collection of, of, of categories, an obvious way is to do it as a functor from B to the cat of, uh, category of categories. And then there's an op here. Uh, and, and, and this is the natural way to, uh, to do it. There's an equivalent way uh, of describing it like a, as a special functor with B as codomain. And this is the description as a vibration or as a, as a fiber category. Um, let me let me give the idea uh, of this, but before doing so, uh, uh, in in logic and computer science, maybe I should say theoretical computer science, the vibration has become as has become a, a standard model, categorical model for a predicate logic for typed predicate uh, uh, logic. And in uh, although the the concept of a fiber category is in itself not trivial uh, and it takes some time to get get into it the community i think has ab absorbed uh, this notion and you see it in many papers standardly being used these days um uh, good so if you want to know more i published a book on this uh, more than 20 years ago and uh, uh, it contains a lot of uh, material now let's look at the logical view on uh, vibrations uh, so, so vibration is a functor of this form, uh, uh, from a category E to a category B. E is often called the, the total category and B the base category. Category B uh, is seen as a category of types and E is a category of predicates and they, they live over time. So a predicate is always a predicate on something and this something uh, is, is a type. Um, you, do, you can do uh, traditionally, if you open a book on, on, uh, on uh, uh, predicate logic, it's usually done in a single sorted way. But what's much more useful in computer science context is a, is a many sorted uh, predicate logic, or as people say, uh, more in a more modern terminology, a typed predicate logic instead of many sorted. I will skip the formal definition because it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it confuses certainly in the beginning and you have to sit down and, and think through it, but I'll, I'll give the idea. 
Um, so the idea is that the, uh, if I have my vibration here and in the base category, I have a map f from x to y, and I have an object q above y. And this above is very, very important. That means that the function of p maps q to y. Then you can sort of pull back. This is not formally a pullback, but it, the, uh, 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 it's often called uh, a pullback uh, in, this, uh, in this context. And similar notation is used, and pull back is indeed an instance of this uh, for certain vibration. But you can sort of pull back this, uh, pull back this Q along uh, F to something called F star, and F star lives above X, and there's also a map from F star Q to Q, and this lives above F. Again, lives above means that the font of P maps it to, to uh, F. And this map is suitably universal. And I'll leave it at this. And if you're interested, have a look in, uh, at some uh, standard definitions. And if you know already what it is, you can prob uh, probably fill it in. But at first, it doesn't help very much to know what the what the uh, uh, the intuition is. Now, this this sort of pullback of a, a predicate along a map is something that comes up very often also in computation. It's the weakest precondition. Uh, associated uh, with, uh, with uh, computation. So if you see f as a computation from x to y and q as a, as a predicate on the codomain, this f star is, is the pulling back the weakest precondition associated with q uh, for the computation f. Now f here is, a, is an arbitrary morphism in the base category, but it can be, um, for instance, a probabilistic map if the base category is the Claisley category, let's say, of the uh, distribution monad or the power set monad, this, this formalism is very, very general and powerful and incorporates uh, many things which are useful in uh, computer science. And in logical examples, the fiber category, the fiber subcategory E sub X, that is uh, the category of objects and maps above X and B is a pre-order. We know in category theory uh, that that logic corresponds to the pre-order or post-set case. And if you really do uh, uh, want to do a type uh, setting, you use categories properly um, and, and where maps may correspond to proofs. But in logic, when you ignore proofs, you, you get a, a pre-order. Very good. Let's see, let's see two examples. Uh, Again, this is meant for, for people with some background in type theory or maybe, uh, maybe computer science. We can have a, a category T, a base category T of, uh, of types. In some type theory, I want to abstract from the, the details here what the type theory is. And uh, more for instance, from Sigma Tau is a term M, oh, M uh, which is of type Tau, but involves a variable of type Sigma. And the term Actually, the morphism is an equivalence class of, ter of terms under some uh, equivalence relation, uh, which includes, for instance, the beta rule in, in the lambda calculus or other types of conversions that you incorporate into your, your uh, category. This way. The standard way to turn a category, uh, a type theory into a category. Uh, now let's talk, uh, write P for the, uh, the total category. Uh, where the logic lives. And the objects here are pair sigma comma phi, where phi is a proposition in context sigma. So phi of x is really a, a predicate, a, a proposition involving a variable, and the, uh, the variable is typed and comes from sigma. Now, what is a map in P? A map is something which goes from a uh, predicate phi, uh, phi on sigma to a predicate psi on tau. It's, uh, it's actually a map in the base category from sigma to tau such that this holds. And uh, this, this is an tailment. So uh, from phi, we can derive uh, psi, the proposition, uh, the, the predicate psi, but in which I've substituted m uh, at the uh, y places in psi. And I've written this this bit here to to remind ourselves that we're doing this in an in indexed way, 
and that an uh, variable x of type sigma is still playing a role here in the uh, in the background in this entailment. This entailment gives a pre-order, and this all translates very nicely into a categorical structure. And uh, substitution in the vibration is then substitution. Uh, if I have a term m from sigma to tau and a predicate psi on tau, I can turn it into a, a predicate on sigma by substituting m into psi. And uh, m is itself then a map from, uh, from this to, uh, to this. Uh, and the entailment then becomes a tautology. Um, so in this way, you can see that, that uh, a longer term, you can, you can pull back a, 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 a predicate uh, by substitution. And this is the abstract idea that you try to capture in a, in a vibration. Let's see one more uh, example, very, very simple one, a set theoretic example. And here you, you clearly see predicates now. So that's what path for the category which has pairs x comma p as objects. A p is a subset of x. So it's sub, subsets, I, I keep the carrier set x uh, uh, around. Now a map um, in the category predicates from x comma p to y comma q, a q is an, a subset of y, is a function between the underlying sets, such that if x is an element of p, then f of x is in q. Uh, another way to say this is that P is contained in the in the inverse image of, of Q. Now we then we then have a, a, uh, a forgetful function from predicates to sets. Simply R typo here. This should, this should be uh, should be an X. So there's also a functor like this, but actually it's comprehension. We'll see we see uh, this later. But this the the functor I meant here should have an X. Here. Sorry for the typos. Um, and uh, how can we do uh, inverse image? So uh, here is our uh, vibration from predicates to sets, the forgetful function. Well, I have a function here, a predicate Q on Y, that means Q is a subset of Y. Uh, I can turn it into a subset of X simply by pulling back the predicate along the, fun on the function, giving me a subset. Uh, and this map is suitably universal in the sense that you want for, uh, for a vibration. There are many, many variations on this. Instead of uh, sets, we can use topological metric or, or all kinds of ordered spaces. And as predicates, we can use open and closed subsets in, in uh, various ways. And so in this way, very many models arise. Other examples are uh, if you have an arbitrary category with pullbacks, you can take the subobjects uh, uh, forming a vibration in this sense. So taking the subobjects generalizes this example of predicates over sets. And uh, I guess you can do this for, for yourself. But for now, this suffices to give you an idea of what's uh, going on here. Good. Um, so I talked about predicates, uh, but uh, I also like to talk about relations. And uh, if we're in the this framework of vibrations, there is a very neat, snappy way to get relations to move to the world of uh, relations, we can take the pullback of functors, uh, as in this diagram. So I have the, the product functor on here. And actually, what, what I get in here are the predicates on a product x cross x. And a predicate on a product is really, as we know, a relation um, in this way. And this is a, a neat way of getting a, a category of relations uh, in this context. So on the, on the right, we have a logic of predicates and, and here we have a logic on, of relations on the, on the left. Okay, now let's look at some structure in these uh, categories and also in the vibrations that we're uh, using. Let's see, uh, we'll fix your vibration now and I'll build up the assumption that's, uh, that I'll uh, use in this talk. And the first uh, one is that uh, the base category has finite products, finite co-products, and there's a distributivity requirement. Um, I will not go to, into the distributivity requirement, but you, you need it at some stage if you want to move things here into the world of relations. Um, um, but that's, that's for people who want to look at the details at some stage. 
if I have this structure on uh, category B, on my base category B, I can interpret simple polynomial functors as functors from B to B, simply by induction on the structure of, of the functor. What I do have to do is choose constants as, as objects in my base category, but once I've done that, the identity becomes the identity, etc., and I can use uh, this uh, structure. So in this way, uh, the, the example I've been using t of x is l plus x cos x is uh, uh, formally an in interpretation of a polynomial expression into this uh, function. Um, ah, this, this is at the, at the uh, this remarks uh, somehow ended up at the wrong place. Uh, uh, it, it has to be at the next slide. Uh, that's a slight missing. Uh, so I'll, I'll improvise. Uh, there are simple, similar uh, assumptions for predicates. And uh, the assumptions for predicates are, are uh, very simple, similar for types, but they live in the, the uh, total category. So, and they speak about Fibers. Uh, uh, and remember, I said that in a logic, uh, we live in a, in a world of pre-orders or process. What I require is that each fiber is a distributive category. So it has meets and uh, uh, top elements, it has joins and, uh, and least elements zero, uh, and also distributivity. And uh, I assume uh, that all this structure is preserved by the by substitution. Again, this is a technical requirement which I don't uh, uh, need here. An interesting thing is then, and this is where this part comes from, that the final uh, taking uh, assigning to an object in B, the final object in the fiber over that object gives a right adjoint to the to the uh, uh, foundation function itself. Um, okay, uh, so here, here it is what, uh, what I uh, was just saying. Um, interestingly is I, I require the structure to, to exist in the fibers. Uh, but then uh, there's an easy result that says that uh, oh, even if I have this only in the fibers, I can on the total category of, uh, of uh, predicates, I can define products. I can construct them in the, the following way. So if I have two predicates P and Q living over X and Y, I can take the product in the base category. Uh, I can pull back P to P one star of P and pull back Q to P two star of uh, Q. And I can take the meet or intersection here in the, in the fiber. And then this turns out to be a categorical product uh, in the total category E. And this is interesting. This is, uh, this is interesting. And actually the construction that's, that's used here is very common in uh, various logical situations where you turn a, a, a meat into a categorical uh, product and there's some fiber infrastructure behind it. Uh, I also have a, 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 an additional assumption, which makes the uh, fibration into a bifibration. And, uh, and so you have lifting in the, the, of arrows in a different way. But the easiest way to understand this now is having left the joints to substitution. And this should be a capital sigma like here. This is the notation that I will use here. So if I have a map in the base category, substitution goes in the, in the other direction. I'm assuming a left up joint sigma f here. And one of the nice things uh, that you can do if you have such left up joints is to define an equality relation. Equality is the sum along the diagonal, the, 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 the sum uh, along truth. And this nicely gives a, a function from the base category to the category of relations on, on here. So in presence of these left adjoints to substitution, the, uh, I get equality in my logic. Okay, um, there's also a way to construct co-products in the total category of, uh, of uh, 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 categories. 
So if I have again P over X and Q over Y, in presence of the sum, I can take this, the, the uh, uh, sum along the co-projection. The co-projection lives here in the base category into the co-product X plus Y here. Uh, I can also take the sum here and then uh, take the join in the fiber. And again, you can prove that this is categorically a, a, a well-behaved co-product. And uh, basically the same construction of products and co-products works for relations and a category of relations. Uh, but here uh, uh, you have to use distributivity in a, uh, in a rather obvious uh, way. But I will not go into the details. <clears throat> what is the situation now? Under the previous assumptions, we know that the total categories of, of predicates and of relations also have the structure of products and finite products and finite co-products. And uh, hence, if we have a polynomial functor as a polynomial expressions, we can not only interpret it in the base category, but also on this total category of predicates and of relations. And this happens in a, in a very economical way using the logical structure that we assume. And this is the key idea here. So you can lift the functor from, from the level of types to the level of predicates or relations by induction on the structure. The only thing we still have to decide what we do with constants and uh, interpretation of a constant C in the base category is replaced by truth when, uh, for predicates and by equality for relations. Equality, sorry, this should be a C again. And what you get in this way is that uh, 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 what's called predicate and relation lifting. So if I have F here on the base category, I can lift it by induction on the structure of F to the total category simply by interpreting products and co-products. And the, the same works here for relations. <clears throat> so this is relation lifting of this uh, uh, functor, which happens very phenomenal. And uh, these lifted functors, they actually commute with truth and with equality. So predicate lifting preserves truth and relation lifting preserves equality. That's a very basic uh, property, which almost follows uh, uh, by the definition. You have to do a little bit of work for that. Good. Um, if we have this functor f on the base category, interpreted on the base category, we can look at its category of algebras and also category of co-algebras of these functors. I've not defined what these categories of algebras and co-algebras are, but I'm, I'm assuming you somehow know or others otherwise can find out easier. But now we can also, with these lifted functors, we can look at algebras of the predicate lifting, co-algebras of the predicate lifting, algebras of the relation lifting, and co-algebras of the relation lifting. And very interestingly, they have clear logical meanings. So an algebra of this predicate lifting is what, what's sometimes called an inductive predicate. And I'll give an example in, the, in this in a minute. A co-algebra of a predicate lifting is an invariant as it's called in, in uh, computer science. If you, it, it's, a, it's a predicate which, uh, once it holds, it continues to hold no matter which transitions you make with your co-algebra or with your transition system. Algebras of the relation lifter in, uh, of the functor are congruences. So they are relations which are closed on the algebraic operations that you have. And you may expect by now co-algebras of the relation lifting, they are bisimilars. And uh, this is sort of a fascinating diagram. Right? It, 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 uh, it shows how these, these basic notions come up in a, uh, in a straightforward uh, manner by pushing this uh, formalism. And all these uh, uh, predicates and relations are suitably closed under the algebraic and co-algebraic operations. And I, I, I consider this as a nice example of letting the formalism do the work for you. Uh, you, you. You have a very abstract construction, you push it through in, in concrete examples, and that gives you precisely uh, what you need in that particular situation in a specific logic given by a formation. The, the, the abstract notions are adapted there. Good, let's, let's look at an example of, a, of an inductive predicate 
I'll use my running example of uh, trees uh, here. Um, so this gets uh, maybe a little bit hairy. Uh, so so uh, uh, I have predicates over sets. I have predicate lifting. I, uh, I have a co-algebra in my base, uh, sorry, an algebra in the, in the base category from L plus X cross X to X. This is algebra so form H is a co-tube of two maps. And here is an algebra of this predicate lifting. So P on X is the, is the predicate and pred T on this predicate uh, for this functor T. Uh, we can now uh, inductively unpack the definition of pred T using the definition of co-products and, and, uh, and products that I defined earlier. And what this amounts to is uh, that if I have a Z element Z in T of X, which is L plus X cross X, this Z can be either of the form A in L, label A in L, or, or a pair X1, X2. Now, this predicate on A always holds. It's true. Remember that on constants, we interpreted, uh, we use the interpretation of truth. And on a pair, P, uh, 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 the requirement is that P holds, predicate P holds for both X1 and for, for X2. And this follows from the conjunction that's used in the definition of, uh, of a product uh, uh, of relations. And the fact that uh, P carries an algebra means that it's closed under the old uh, algebra operation H, which is this quadruple H1 and H2, and which can be made uh, precise in this, in this form that P always holds for, for trees, which consists only of a node. And if P holds for two trees, then it also holds for the joining of these uh, trees. And you see what's, uh, what, uh, what's appearing here, the assumptions on a predicate that you're typically use in an induction proof. And that's why these are called inductive predicates uh, uh, because they're used in such a proof. Okay, let's look briefly at by simulation, how this looks. So suppose I have a relation on X cross X and I now have a co-algebra, oh no, again a typo, this pred should be real. I should have checked my slides better. <clears throat> but at least you see these are freshly written slides for, for this uh, presentation. I didn't use any slides of 20 years ago and uh, I haven't done any recycling here. Uh, so I sat down and uh, I wrote my slides again. Uh, anyway, so the co-algebra here in the base category exists and we ask, what does it mean that it lifts to rel T of this R? Now, rel T uh, on two elements, A1, A2, in the, two, in the labels. Uh, remember, we used equality on the constants here. And on two pairs, we require that the relation holds on, on both combinations of these pairs. And if we, we, we go through uh, all this, we see that the notion of by simulation here, which is a co-algebra of this lifted functor, says that if x1 and x2 are in R, and C of X1 gives the label and C of X2 also gives the label, then the label should be equal. And actually what's implicit in the formalism that if C1 gives the label, then also C on X1 gives a label, then also C on X2 should give a label, a label and vice versa. And if they give pairs, uh, they both give pairs, then R should hold of the, of the uh, pairs again. So R continues to hold in this uh, situation. And this is what's called a bias simulation and it comes out nicely from the formulas. Okay, so now let's look at induction and, and, and uh, co-induction. And uh, here we can uh, start reasoning a bit more categorically. Remember that we had this situation where the functor F on the base category, we lifted it to the total category and truth the truth predicate was a functor like this in this situation. Now we can take algebras of this predicate lifting. We can take also take algebras of F. Uh, there is a functor, a forgetful functor then from algebras of predicates of F uh, to algebras of F. It's actually also a vibration, but that's not so relevant. And this adjoint here gives an adjoint in this, uh, in this situation. That requires a little bit of uh, uh, abstract reasoning. Well, actually, it follows directly from preservation in this situation. 
And uh, for relation lifting, you have a dual situation. So I have F from B to B, it's lifted to rel of F on, on uh, relations. We have an equality functor in, in this uh, direction. And uh, we can look at corals rels of F and corals rels of relations of F. And this gives equality, gives a functor between these categories of, of corals. This looks all, uh, all uh, um, uh, like uh, I would always say in German Spielerei, right? it's uh, like a game, but it's, an, it's a relevant game because uh, uh, the definition says that we can now say that the whole situation, the logic admits induction. If this uh, functor LG of the truth functor from F to predicate of F preserves initiality. That means that the uh, the initial algebra uh, 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 has uh, the carries the initial object, the initial uh, predicate F algebra. As you may may expect, co-induction means that uh, the co-algebra of equality function from co-algebra of F also preserves finality, so that uh, the the final co-algebra uh, of F is mapped to a final real F co-algebra. It's actually very smooth in this way. Now, what does it mean if you unravel this? Induction means that each inductive predicate contains the image of the unique map from each uh, initial algebra. If, if an inductive predicate is a predicate itself on, uh, on the initial algebra, that's the usual form of induction, it says that it, it must contain the truth predicate. So, so uh, uh, it, but this formulation is more is more general in that sense. A co-induction means that elements in the bisimulation are equal, become equal when they are mapped to the final co-algebra. And this is an important co-inductor proof principle, which can be used in in uh, in various settings. And it comes out from of this uh, very general set. And as an aside, there's also a relational version that emerges in this situation, a relational version of induction, and uh, which says that each congruence contains the image of the diagonal on the on the initial algebra. And actually, I was not aware of this of this uh, binary version of uh, the induction uh, principle. And only by doing this work, I came up as a as a theoretical possibility. And I thought, oh. That's, that's nice, and it works. It's equivalent to the union, unary version uh, under some very mild con uh, conditions. And uh, so I, uh, I looked around, and it, it does exist in the literature, but only in, I found it only in one or two places. So, uh, so it's cute that it comes out from the general approach. i like to close with uh, uh, two uh, general results. Um, in categorical logic, there's a definition of comprehension, which goes back to Levier, which is actually actually very nice. So a vibration admits comprehension. Actually, Levier did not express it in terms of, of uh, vibrations, but his formulation turns out to be equivalent to, to this one. So remember, we had this truth functor going upwards, which was a right adjoint to the vibration itself. And comprehension simply says that this truth functor should have another right adjoint. So it maps predicates to types, and the right adjointness uh, here precisely gives the appropriate property of comprehension. And it, it maps a predicate to the type of all elements for which the predicate holds. That's, that's the idea here of uh, comprehension, which is nicely captured. Now, via some abstract reasoning, uh, this adjoint here can be transported to this situation here of functors of algebras. So this going, this functor going up gets a right adjoint. And remember that the definition of induction was that this upgoing functor must preserve initiality. But if it has the right adjoint, I mean, each left adjoint preserves our co-limits in, in, in particular preserves the initial object. So the existence of the right adjoint is sufficient condition to, uh, to get initiality in this way. So, so this function from LG F to LG predicate F is a left adjoint and just preserves initiality and which gives you uh, induction. 
Now, as you may, may uh, start su uh, suspecting at this stage, quotients give you co-induction. How does it work? The definition, the categorical definition of, of quotients, which, uh, uh, which I think uh, uh, appeared first in, in, in my own work, also in the, in the 90s somewhere, is that quotients are given categorically by a left adjoint to, uh, to equality in such a situation. And this is quotients of arbitrary relations. And so it's not quotients of equivalence relations, but equivalent, implicitly, you turn a relation into equivalence relation and then use it for a quotient. So it turns a, a, a relation into a type, namely the, the, the type quotiented with the relation itself. Again, this can be transported to this situation where we have uh, categories of co-algebras. And remember now the definition of co-induction said that this functor should uh, preserve uh, finality. And you see the argument now coming. If it have, has a left adjoint, uh, uh, then, of course, finality is preserved uh, because right adjoints preserve all limits. So this is the, the, the main uh, uh, point then, uh, and uh, actually a nice construction in here. So I'll come to conclusions and, uh, nicely in, in, in time, a final remarks. So what I've shown is a structural approach to co-induction and induction. I think it has become mainstream in, in co-algebra, but I should emphasize this is a very, very simple situation. So looking, uh, I looked up this, this uh, paper with uh, Hermida from 89, it has by now 233 citations, which is, which is non-trivial for a theoretical uh, 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 paper. And it has become so sort of common that this lifting is sometimes called Hermida Jacobs lifting, also because there are other forms of lifting and there are other more general forms of lifting as you, you have seen in Heller's work. So you can do lifting, for instance, via image factorization. The more recent version is via co-density uh, using some other universal property. Sometimes also lifting is done via parameter map on the presence of a generic object and, and Heller also talked about such forms of lifting. And so there's a lot of variation here, but typically all these form, uh, forms of lifting, they coincide on the simple situation given by simple polynomial functors. And so it's useful to, to be aware of this, this very basic situations. And I, I've, I've described only a very, very simple situation, but it's good to be aware of this. And it's always nice to know that the world is, is very nice and smooth if you are sufficiently restricted to a sufficiently simple situation. Again, there are many variations and extensions, and especially because there are many notions of variations of what is indistinguishability in, in co-algebra. And this indistinguishability is, is what one tries to capture with the notion of bi-simulation in various forms. So I would like to conclude here. I have a last slide that invites you to uh, provide some feedback and. Uh, ask uh, questions. Thanks uh, for your attention at this stage. Thanks a lot, Pat. Thanks. So I can see, I can count at least 10 questions there. Oh, good. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Helle, oh, sorry, that was a clapping hand. Um, let's see if there are questions. Are there any questions? Um, I have a question myself. Uh, so, in the, or at least in one of the definition of polynomial functors you gave, you included the power set functor. Yeah. Um, so that's a little bit surprising for me, at least. Uh, but do you know uh, what is the, like, exactness characterization of the functors you get if you include the power set functor? Oh yes, I don't think there is one. I don't think there is one. There is an exactness, as I mentioned, for, for polynomial functors on sets, uh, uh, the, the accessibility and, and uh, preservation of countable uh, pullbacks. I'm aware of another uh, uh, exactness characterization result for analytical functors. 
and analytical functors in the sense of uh, Joyal, uh, which are quotients of simple polynomial functors. And the, uh, the uh, exactness condition are there, if I remember con uh, correctly. It's also accessibility and it's preservation of infinite or, or countable weak pullbacks. So weak pullbacks uh, arise there as well. Now, uh, power sets also preserve weak pullbacks. So there might be some connection there, but I'm, I really i am not aware, Jochen. Uh, so that's an open question. Okay, thanks. I saw, uh, I saw another hand, uh, a real hand uh, raised by Ailey. So you saw it as well? Yes, uh, I think you can unmute now, Ailey. Ah, oh, maybe, sorry, maybe I pressed you too fast, so I also muted you again. Sorry about that. Uh, try again, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. No. Um, great. Uh, I was just wondering if the predicate liftings and the other type um, are examples of Khan extensions. Uh, no, the, uh, you'll have to look at those co-density liftings. They are really yeah. described as, as uh, and uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, these co-density liftings, if you restrict them to these simple polynomial functors, they coincide with uh, the, the definitions that I've given. So in that sense, you could say my definitions are, are given by Khan extensions, yes. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. Good. Are there any, any other questions? Um, see. Uh, I have a question, apart from saying thanks, Bart. Lovely talk. Uh, okay. uh, oh, I think eh? uh, I'm, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm wondering if you considered the uh, sort of existential flavor of predicate lifting uh, so you have you know predicate holds everywhere in this structure yeah uh there, there's there's something funny potentially about considering predicate holds somewhere in the structure uh relating to the sort of the container gang's notion of position or david's notion of of direction yeah, yeah. I think this distinction between existential and for all comes up only for more complicated functors. For instance, if you look at the power set functor, there are two canonical uh, ways to lift them to predicates. One, one using existential, the other uh, uh, universal quantification. So I think for these simple polynomial functions, I'm not aware of a meaningful distinction. Uh, so it's, it's fun stuff to I, I think there's a sort of alternative characterization of what it is to be polynomial in terms of the existence of uh, various forms of predicate. No. Okay. And then there's a question from Hash. Oh, sorry. Oh, I did it again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question on slide 25. Um, basically, yeah, this dash, uh, the ex lifting of Q, basically can be seen as a minimization of a co-algebra by um, the chosen by simulation living on the top. Uh, does this technique also work? So I know it will work in when your base category is set, but uh, does this work also in the case of when base category is closely of some something, for example, in modeling non-deterministic automata? Oh, 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 yeah, it's uh, much more subtle. Um, uh -huh. It's uh, much uh, more uh, subtle. Let's uh, see. Um, what comes to mind actually is. Um, uh, there's a very nice setting where it also uh, where this also works is in uh, quantum computing. So uh, a, a, a number of years ago, I've uh, written a, an article on this with uh, several PhD students, and it's it's on 
quotient comprehension chains. If you if you Google that, you'll 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 find this. And the same, so the same uh, structure of quotients and comprehension you you can find in von Neumann algebras, in mm -hmm. a rather non-trivial way, and uh, a very special case. So so uh, probabilistic computing is a special case of quantum computing, namely where everything is uh, commutative. And uh, this structure that you have there restricted to the closely category of the distribution monad, uh, the finite discrete distribution monad. We elaborate things there. It does, uh, so, so there it does work. I can't remember about the closely category of the power set, whether it worked there. Um, anyone in the audience? No, right, really, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, um, it has become a bit rusty. Okay. I, I think in the power set case, even the Q does not exist. Oh, it's quite possible. Quite possible. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Power sets is difficult. <laughs> it's not so well behaved logically. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Interesting. Yeah. So so the structure is canonical. It, uh, it, uh, uh, it exists in, a, in other situations, and I was actually quite surprised and pleased also to find it in the setting of von Neumann algebra, so, which is very difficult mathematically. Yeah. That's it. Okay, thanks again, Bart. That was very nice. Thank you. Thanks for uh, watching. And um, that leaves us with a break of no less than four minutes. That's a luxury. Um, so let's reconvene at in four, four minutes. Did you do that, Joachim, or is that Tim? Oh, it's okay. You're muted, by the way. Yeah, that must be Tim. I mean, all the technical fence, fences, fences, that's Tim. Yeah, so I was muting the speakers, uh, the people raising questions. I was muting them instead of unmuting them. Not, not very nice, but. Uh... I don't know what kind of was that, don't we? Because it's a coffee break, yeah? Where's the coffee? It could also be tea. <laughs> yes, but where is the tea or coffee? <laughs> It's, it's, it's a matter of, of time zones. Uh, yes. I'd rather have a beer, I think. Absolutely positive, not the coffee time of day. No. <laughs> One of these parts. <laughs> so I'm not sure how long I'm surviving. I had my coronavirus injection today. Ah. Congratulations. So you will soon soon be able to travel, maybe. 
I don't know whether that makes a difference. Yeah. I, I had mine a couple of weeks ago, which is, you know, one of the few perks of having had a heart attack. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather not have had the heart attack and still be waiting for the jag, like, but... Uh, <laughs> um, um, oof. And then the alarm goes off to remind me to take my hypertension medication. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I've, I've become one of those people. Right. There's a, alarms that go off to remind them about medication. Uh, but David, maybe I uh, delay you one minute just so people come back from the break. So we start in, in one minute. What happened to your slides, David? They were unshared. Ah, okay. Okay, um, I think we should continue. So um, David will continue with the polynomial abacus. Please, David. Okay, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to remind you of uh, what I think a polynomial is or what it means to me. I always mean one variable today, at least. Um, there's different ways to view it. This, it's the sum of representable functors. This is the representable represented by two, three, uh, three times this uh, representable represented by one and two times that represented by zero. I'll call, uh, if I plug in one here, I get six and those I'll call the positions. So there are six positions here and each position has some number of directions. Um, okay, that's just terminology that conflicts with the container people. And uh, so I'm sorry for that conflict, but hopefully, uh, now I gotta skip ahead here. So we had this abacus, I guess we're going through the whole talk here and we used it to prove things like uh, that co-monoids in poly are categories and co-monoid co maps are co-functors which Bryce talked about yesterday. Um, and so did um, Tarmo. Okay, so I wanted to quickly talk about co-free co-monoids because we got to that late yesterday and I'm gonna use it again today. If you've got any polynomial like y squared plus L or whatever, uh, you would get a co-free co-monoid which is a category because all co-monoids in poly are categories. And that category will actually be free on a graph. And the graph uh, has as nodes, the elements of the terminal algebra, co-algebra that, that uh, Bart talked about. So the, the trees that he drew where he had everything branching once and then it could end on any element of L would be like this one, except uh, he would have used y squared plus L here. Um, so in other words, uh, but, but the point is that the co-free comonoid has as, as vertices or as objects in that category, all possible trees that are, whose nodes are labeled by the positions of P and who branch according to the directions there. Um, okay. And we briefly, we talked about bimodules. A bimodule is just a polynomial mapping to, if I have a polynomial comonad C and another one D, uh, then it's just a map from M to C composed M and from M to M composed D. And uh, I can kind of redraw that as this picture here. So this is just a um, polynomial that maps to M composed C and to M, sorry, C composed M and M composed D. But what Richard Garner told us is that these are exactly parametric right adjoints from D set to C set. These are the connected limit preserving functors from D set to C set. And I'll call those pra functors, uh, kind of like pro functors. Sorry, they're a generalization of pro functors in a certain sense. Um, a, a pra functor takes every object of C and gives you an element of the, uh, gives you an object in the free coproduct completion of the free limit completion of D. So D set op is the free limit completion of D. Uh, and then using this kind of abacus picture, these cobordism or pants-like diagrams, you can prove uh, Richard's result. So um, let's see. 
And I don't remember if I talked about this yesterday. I think I did. But when you compose, we talked about these bridge diagrams in some other talks. Um, Richard's talk and uh, Bryce's talk at least had these bridge diagrams where you delta, pi, and sigma. And if you delta, pi, and sigma again, if E and D and C are, are sets, then I can just use pullbacks here. So I kind of pull back this guy. I do a distribu distributivity pullback here, a pullback here, and a pullback here. And then I, I do delta up here, then pi, and then sigma. And that's how you compose um, polynomials in many variables. It's also how you compose prof functors, uh, parametric right adjoints. You just need to use commas instead. But what I found really amazing about poly um, was that uh, um, I can actually do all of this work just by composing these bimodules in the way that you read about in NLAB. So I have a bicomodule M and a bicomodule N. I just take M composed N as polynomials. You all know how to compose two polynomials. Or I take M composed D composed N, and I have a map from M to M composed D. I have a map from N to D composed N. And so I get these two maps, and the equalizer in poly um, automatically carries the structure of a C E bicomodule. So it's amazing. I, I really find it amazing to watch the, the combinatorics just tell you the answer about all of this uh, very complex looking stuff here. Um, okay, so we get this framed by category P that I call P. The objects are polynomial comonoids, in other words, categories. The morphisms are cofunctors, the verticals are cofunctors, and the horizontals are bicomodules. And um, it's got a lot of structure. Uh, I've already told you this several times, I think, but just, just so you remember, C0 bimodules are just C sets. So every co sheaf category is in here. Um, 1D bimodules are the free coproduct completion of D set op. So um, the uh, free coproduct completion, the free limit completion of D. And C, D bimodules are just functors from C to the thing we just defined. So they're just functors from C to uh, 1D bimodules. Um, there's a nice factorization system on P. Every C, D bimodule can be factored as um, a discrete up vibration uh, followed by, or I guess in a profunctor pro direction, a profunctor followed by a discrete up vibration. Okay, so that's a kind of typical thing to want to do. Um, okay. And then we have Gambino Cox frame by category poly. And for them, the vertical subcategory, the vertical category was set. So the objects are sets, the verticals are functions, and the horizontal maps from I to J are J many polynomials in I many variables. And of course they did this for an arbitrary, um, sorry, not of course, but uh, they did this for an arbitrary uh, locally Cartesian closed category E. Um, I'm just talking about set here today. Um, so the point I wanna make on this slide is that poly is a full subcategory of P. So it's got exactly, uh, so the objects in P are categories and those in poly are, you can consider them as the discrete categories on a set. The verticals in, P's are, in P are cofunctors, uh, but cofunctors between discrete categories are just functors, are just functions between the sets. The horizontals in P are pra functors, but between discrete categories, those are exactly the polynomial functors. And for both of them, the, the two cells are the natural transformations. So what, what we're seeing is that the comonoid theory P of one variable poly does include all of big poly. So that's why it, people say, oh, uh, that your name poly here kind of conflicts with Gambino and Cock, and that's true. And I apologize for that. I seem to do that a lot. Uh, but uh, the point is that this one does kind of contain this one if you move to the comonoid theory. Um, so there's, there's kind of like which one's more general. In some sense, this one's more general than poly, and this one's more general than, than, than this poly, but, but it's all kind of contained on the slide, and, and of course they're all friends. So um, I wanted to talk about adjunctions in P, uh, just to, so, oh, I should have introduced the talk today by saying that um, I'll start with some theory uh, finishing up yesterday, and then I'll move to applications. So, um, so the blank mod zero, uh, the zero, blank zero by modules take any category and return the category of copri sheaves on it. I guess this is a large thing here, but um, it's locally fully faithful, which means that if you have any two categories, C and D, then only some functors from D set to C set count as bicomodules. Um, 
uh, from C to D, namely the parafunctors, the, the ones that preserve, if M preserves connected limits, then it's a bimodule or bicomodule. But if you have two of them that do, what locally fully faithful means is that the bicomodule maps between them are exactly the natural transformations. And so that means that it's really easy to see whether uh, a bicomodule M has an adjoint in P or not. Namely, you just ask if it has an, if it, if the functor from C set to D set has a, an adjoint. And if it does, and that adjoint is in P, then, then it's an adjoint, uh, then they're ad adjoint in P. Um, so as long as your adjoint to a functor C set to D set preserves connected limits, it's then you have an adjunction in P. Okay, so both functors and cofunctors induce adjunctions in P or POP. Um, I'm using POP because that's the usual one where people, where we think about parametric right adjoint functors in this sort of way. So if you have a functor from C to D, then pull back and write con extension, give you an adjunction that we would write delta F pi F. Um, the companion and conjoint of a cofunctor, so I have a cofunctor here, and in a frame by category, every vertical map has a companion and conjoint, and those you those will also be adjoint pro uh, adjoint uh, bi modules. And I'll write them as sigma and delta, even though this sigma might seem to conflict uh, with sigma along a functor. The thing is that a sigma along a functor, the left con extension is only going to be um, in P when that when that functor is a discrete op vibration. And in the case where the functor is a discrete op vibration, it's both a functor and a cofunctor. So a discrete op vibration is where they kind of uh, meet. And, um, and then the two things I've called delta coincide. So um, you kind of have deltas and pi's for functors and sigmas and deltas for cofunctors, and uh, they agree for discrete op vibrations. Now, I think it's interesting that cofunctors C to D induce interesting map between these co sheaf toposes. So a geometric morphism, if you've heard of uh, much about topos theory, you know it's a, um, an adjunction between two toposes that preserves finite limits. Sorry, the, the right adjoint always does and the left adjoint used to preserve finite limits. Cofunctors induce adjunctions that preserve connected limits. So that's a kind of interesting uh, other sort of um, morphism between toposes. So essential geometric morphisms have this property but you can think of a connected limit as like any limit except for the terminal object. Now, of course, products are not connected limits, but products are pullbacks over the terminal object and pullbacks are connected limits. So if you know where the terminal object goes, then you preserve all the other limits in some sense. Okay, so I, I don't, I, I'm kind of interested in, if anyone knows um, in what, what we can do with the logic if we had uh, the, lo the internal logic of C set and D set and what we would know about it uh, using not geometric morphisms, but these kind of connected limit preserving morphisms instead. Okay, so in any frame by category, uh, we can talk about monads and in P these generalize operads um, or at least close to it. So if, uh, a monad in a frame by category, you have an object, which is kind of the type of the monad. You have a, a horizontal cell, a horizontal one cell called M, the carrier of the monad. You have a two cell from the identity on C to M and a two cell from M composed M to M called the unit and multiplication. And these satisfy the usual laws. Um, these generalize operads in a number of ways. So if, if I is discrete and eta and mu are Cartesian, meaning they, um, well, I guess that means that uh, on the maps of polynomials, they preserve, directions, their isos on the directions, then you get something very close to colored operads. Not quite the uh, standard definition, but no less elegant in some sense. So the input to a morphism is a set rather than a list of objects, uh, but you could also get the standard list-based ob objects using uh, technology and gambino cock using ca uh, Cartesian maps to list and stuff. Um, so this wouldn't satisfy David uh, Gepner's talk yesterday or the day before where he was interested in and really the finitariness because um, you would have to restrict your polynomials to be finite, finite and, and things like that. But, but uh, you do get a kind of generalization of colored operads where you have a set of inputs rather than a, a list. And then if you relax the discreteness of C, so we're in this frame by category P where you have all categories as your objects. And if we allow our category to be uh, a non-discrete one, 
then the domain of a morphism could be a diagram rather than, rather than just a set of objects. So just imagine that instead of uh, a, you know, a morphism with three inputs and one output, you have a morphism with a pullback diagram or something like that, or, or a span or co-span as its input. And I'll, I'll kind of give an example. I mean, really, I'm just saying these are monads. So it's, it's, these are polynomial or uh, uh, parametric right adjoint monads, but um, I'll give some examples in a second. Um, I wanted to also talk about, so we're talking about monads, um, as Bryce mentioned, categories are monads in span. And I just wanted to draw that picture for you with this kind of bimodule notation. So because these triangles represent composition uh, and composition is, is not symmetric, I can just turn them around and that just means composition in the other order. Um, so a profunctor uh, from a discrete category on O to a discrete category on O, many objects, would you would think of it like a span if it didn't have any pi part. In other words, if it's a left adjoint. And if it's a left adjoint and it's a monad, then it's right adjoint is a comonad. So we'd get this comonad. And now since the vertical part of P is already comonoids in poly, um, I think some technology from Shulman and Crutwell will tell us that C, but you can just prove it directly also, that C, this polynomial here mapping to OY composed C and from C to, o, C to C composed OY, that thing has a canonical comonoid structure and is equipped with a map from C to OY. And comonoids in poly are just categories. And it turns out that this map will be identity on objects because C is a right adjoint. So if you believe a lot of these like assertions, which are not too hard to prove once you get used to working with this stuff, once especially with those abacus pictures, they at least helped me a lot. Um, you get used to seeing that what we found is that a, uh, a left adjoint monad has become a right adjoint comonad, which becomes just a comonoid in poly with an identity on objects mapped to O. So it just becomes a category uh, with objects O. And so that's kind of internally how M induces a category. And here's a picture of how functors and cofunctors look in this perspective. A functor between two categories You've got objects O and morphisms M, or this F M also stands for the left adjoint monad, then a map between categories or a functor is a map from O to O prime and a map of monads here, making this thing a two cell. And a map of, co if we use their left adjoints, uh, sorry, their right adjoint comonads, then it would be asking this thing to be a map of comonads. That would be a cofunctor. Um, hopefully that relates with uh, Bob Perret's retro cells, but I think either Bob or, uh, Bryce could do a better job of, of explaining whether that's uh, a literal uh, instant connection or, or whether it needs some work to prove. Um, I wanted to give one last example of monads, namely Grothendieck sites. So if you have a Grothendieck site on C, I'll tell you what those are in a second if you've forgotten, but they're the place where you define sheaves and, and general uh, toposes. Um, Grow the deep toposes. So if I have a site uh, uh, on C op, this way I get to talk about co pre-sheaves instead of pre-sheaves, um, then it has an associated uh, monad in P. And when I say it's associated, what do I mean? I mean that all the J sheaves will give you uh, algebras on this monad, not that all algebras are J sheaves. The point is that an MJ algebra gives you a formula for gluing, if you know about this sort of thing. Uh, you can glue, glue compatible families using this MJ algebra structure, but the MJ algebra structure doesn't guarantee any sort of uniqueness. So here's how it works. A growth unique topology, given a growth unique topology, I need to give you a monad. And so let me remind you what a growth unique topology is. Let's say C is like a topological space, but you can just think it's an arbitrary category here. So whichever terminology you prefer, um, whichever way you prefer to follow. But let's say you have an open set then the topology gives you a set of covering families. It tells you which uh, families of opens cover that uh, open, that's JV. And for every family, every covering family F, uh, what does it mean that it's a family? It means it's a subfunctor of the representable on B. Now, I, I, this subfunctor is a functor from C to set. And we always, it's the polynomial um, perspective uh, wants us to denote, or I want to denote, sub uh, functors from C to set using their, cat, using their set of elements. It's just a very natural thing because that set of elements, uh, the set of elements of a functor has a C coalgebra structure. So it's just, this is the carrier of a C coalgebra. Um, so I, I'll denote this functor, this, this sieve uh, using um, its set of elements. 
Anyway, so in other words, we've got this growth unique topology that tells us what covers what. And from this, we define this monad in poly. It says uh, it's just a polynomial. And the polynomial is the sum over objects in C of the sum over all families that cover that object of Y to the power uh, the elements of that subfunctor, uh, which is just some set. And then the growth unique topology axioms, when you look at the three axioms, one of them endows us with a bimodule structure from C to C, and the other two endow it with a monad structure. And then in algebra, if I had a map from MP to P, if P is a pre-sheaf, or I guess really a co-pre-sheaf, when is that thing a sheaf? Um, oh, sorry, no, I'm not telling you when it's a sheaf. I'm telling you when you are given a gluing formula. A gluing formula is just a map from M composed P to P. It would assign for every object in C and every cover of it and every, glue, every um, compatible family of sections, uh, a glued section. So that concludes the theory part of the talk and of the tutorial, and I'll move into applications. Um, but I hope it's clear now that we've got this well-oiled machine, it, at least theoretically, it's, it's beautiful. And we see how they work, we see how everything works using concrete calculations. And our next job is to just take this shiny abacus out for a skin. Now, what do I mean by the abacus? I'm not really gonna keep using those pictures. I really just mean the concrete world of polynomials and polynomial cominoids and, and the frame by category P. So why do I think it's appropriate? If you tuned in last time, I talked about the glass bead game where they use this, these um, uh, kind of abacuses with glass beads on them to talk about all sorts of uh, things in the world. Uh, that's what my job is to now, to now show you uh, that we can talk about interesting things using this frame by category P. So I'll start with more machines. Uh, a more machine, uh, Hella talked about this in her talk, an AB more machine, which we draw this way, it's as though it has inputs A and outputs B, but what is it? It's a set S of states. Uh, it's just elements of this set are called states. There's a function called R from S to B, the readout. I can take a state and read out what it, its current output is. And then I can take a state and an input and get a new state. And I'll call that the update map. And we would say this more machine is initialized if there's also an initial, if there's also a choice of uh, state. Okay, so why is this a machine? Well, it, it's kind of dynamical. It does stuff through time. And what it does is it takes streams of A's coming in on the input and gives out streams of B's coming on the output. So how does it do that? Well, given a stream or a list of A's, we could define the N plus first state. We already got our, our zeroth state. We define the n plus first state to be the update applied to the nth state and the nth input. And then we could define the nth output to be the readout of the nth state. And by doing that, we get a list or a stream of Bs. And so we, we really, we draw it this way because we imagine a list of A's coming in and a list of Bs coming out, but it's really just this data here that allows us to do that. Um, now in terms of polynomials, a more machine like this is just a function from S to B times S to the A. Every element of S gets an element of B and gets an element of, uh, gets a function from A to S. So it's just a BY to the A co-algebra. You can also phrase it as a map from SY to the S to BY to the A. Uh, but um, I, uh, because we've been talking about co-algebras and I just think it's actually more natural to think of them as co-algebras. So I, I used to talk about them this way, but um, I'll certainly be moving to this way today. So a P co-algebra for an arbitrary P polynomial P all it does, the only difference between that and a by to the a coalgebra, like this is a polynomial that's a monomial. It's just got one sort of exponent. A polynomial allows different input sets at different positions. So imagine that instead of receiving a list of inputs, um, it's, as though, it's as though you are moving around some map or something. And when you're in a tunnel, uh, you're in one position and you're, only you're not receiving GPS signals. And when your eyes are closed, you're not receiving uh, visual signals. Um, you probably shouldn't be driving at that point. But, uh, so, but the point is that you can kind of change your position and uh, get, different, get different inputs at different times. So it's just that, so given a, a polynomial co-algebra, we can think of it as every element of S, every state gets an output or a position in the polynomial. 
in the tunnel, out of the tunnel, saying hello, saying goodbye, whatever, um, things that you can display to the world, and uh, an update, given any direction in that position, you get a next state. But even more generally, a functor from C to set could be considered as a, as a um, which is just a C coalgebra for C comonoid, that kind of coalgebra, um, an eilenberg mohr type coalgebra. So this generalizes a functor from C to set. I mean, you'd say, wow, you're gonna call that a dynamical system. I guess I am. So I'll try to explain why I wanna call that a dynamical system. Um, because first of all, let me say why I think it generalized, why it does generalize the previous thing. P coalgebras, the category of P coalgebras is exactly the category of CP sets where CP is the co-free guy I drew in the beginning, those infinite trees and the paths up them. Uh, so we, we see p, uh, functors from C to set as a generalization of the above, but we can also see it as a dynamical system. So imagine you have a functor from C to set and take its category of elements, this, you know, this etal thing over C, and for every element in there, think of that as a state, okay? And this, the position of that state is the, is the object in C that you're over. And the directions or the things that can happen to you is that someone downstairs in C can direct you around by giving you a, a morphism coming out of that object. So for any map coming out of the object you're at, um, you just update your current state to, to uh, the next one in the, category, in the category of elements. So I'll call any of these things dynamical systems. Uh, I'm not really gonna lean on that at all. I'm just saying that we can call them dynamical systems. Um, uh, so so uh, mainly I'll be talking about PICO algebras as dynamical systems. So imagine we have a bunch of dynamical systems interacting in an open system. Someone the other day asked um, about distributed computing and maybe this would be an answer for them. Uh, so here in this picture, every one of these boxes, so there are six boxes here, P1 through P5 and Q, and every one of them represents a monomial where you put the inputs as the exponent and you put the outputs as the coefficient. And uh, this whole interaction phi, which this diagram is supposed to represent, is captured by a certain map of polynomials from P1 tensor P2 tensor P5 to Q. Um, basically, this map of polynomials says that if you knew what each of these out P's was outputting, each of these guys was outputting, uh, you would be able to get an output for Q. And if you furthermore had an input from Q and all these outputs, you'd be able to shuttle all that data around to all the inputs. So this wiring diagram here is given by a certain map of polynomials from P1 tensor P5 to Q. And now if you happen to endow each of these P1 through P5 with a coalgebra, SI mapping to PI of SI, then we could tensor all of those together and using the duoidal, the fact that uh, poly is duoidal, which Tarmo told us the other day, uh, we could tensor them all together and get a coalgebra of Q. So we tensor these all together, get a coalgebra of this thing, and then compose with Q, that with phi to get a coalgebra of Q. And what that means is if you had dynamics or a Mohr machine in P1 through P5, you would use this wiring diagram to get a Mohr machine on Q. It would just shuttle all of the outputs around to where they need to go uh, so that you could uh, output something on Q. Um, but even more general interaction is possible with these polynomials. And even though I said every wiring diagram you can draw, roughly speaking, um, uh, is, a, is such a, so the only thing you can't do is you can't have a straight across wire that doesn't hit any boxes. Other than that, any wiring diagram you draw, even with splitting, um, uh, would, would give, give you one of these. But in fact, a morphism of polynomials is more general than just wiring diagrams. Uh, for one thing, you can have wiring diagrams that change uh, in some sense, based on what's happening internally in these dynamics. So that's, to make that more precise, what I'm saying is that this whole picture here is one map of polynomials. So what is this picture here? It's talking about a company with two different suppliers and the company seems to be able to choose which supplier it's getting its widgets from. So um, both suppliers uh, have output W, so they both have interface W times Y. And the company has interface 2y to the w because um, it's inputting a w and it's choosing whether to uh, wire one way or the other. And then the outer box here has no inputs or outputs, so it's just y. 
And so this whole picture here represents a map, a polynomial map from W times Y times W times Y, uh, sorry, tensor, tensor two Y to the W to Y. Um, so to, what is that? It's just a map from two W squared Y to the W to Y. And that's equivalent to a function from two W squared to W. And that you can just take to be evaluation. So all this, all this stuff, uh, this map here, which is this supposed to be represented up here is just kind of the company's choice determines which supplier it, it gets from. Okay. Um, now, dynamical systems as are usually defined, they're usually defined as an action of a, of a monoid. So the discrete dynamical systems, reversible dynamical systems, real-time dynamical systems, the monoid might be the naturals or the integers, the reals, or it might, might even have measure or topology, which I'm not gonna talk about today. I don't know whether that um, corresponds to polynomials in other categories or not. But uh, if T is a monoid and S is a set, then uh, T action on S is equivalently just a functor from the monoid to set. Um, and so it does satisfy our general definition above of what a dynamical system is. Uh, that's one reason I made it so general here, just because I wanted to cover that usual case. But the summary of all the dynamical system stuff so far, all this more machines and wiring diagram stuff is that poly can encode dynamical systems, general sorts, this sort, or the more machines or melee machines or whatever, uh, and uh, wiring diagrams, or as David Jazz Myers calls these rewiring diagrams. Okay, uh, so that kind of concludes the dynamical system stuff. Let me go on to databases, which is another uh, application of our, our abacus here, or kind of towards a glass bead game point of view. So what else can polynomial functors do? Well, they can tell us about uh, databases. What's a database? A database has a schema, and here is, a, you can think of it as a copre sheaf, basically, or, or roughly. So um, and we'll get to what it more, it more, more is in a second. So here I have a category represented. It's got two objects, employee and department. It's got a morphism called manager from employee to itself, works in, takes every employee to a department, and department, uh, admin takes a department to an employee. But instead of just taking the free category on this graph, let's add a congruence that says that if I go from department to employee by taking the admin and I see where they work, it is that department. And so a functor from C to set, in other words, a bimodule like this, can be represented, um, or, or here's an example of one. So we've got uh, every object of C, like employee gets a set, say this set, uh, just some random set, meaningless identifiers. Uh, heart, T star, 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 and Orca. Department gets a set, say blue and P9. And then works in, this column represents a function that takes every employee to a department. Uh, heart goes to P9, T star, star, star goes to blue, et cetera. And you can check that if you go, I mean, I wrote it down to, to work such that if you go from employee, sorry, if you go from a department to its admin person and you see what, uh, what, where they work, it is that department. So this is a functor from C to set. Now, this is kind of an anonymized database. So Copri sheep is more like an anonymized database where you know everything's connection. You know all the connections between the, the, the entities, but you don't know, you can't read what they are or how to identify them in the real world. So if you want that sort of thing, so you want uh, first names and department names, then we call those attributes. And you, that is definitely an important part of databases. And so to get attributes, what you do is you assign a copre sheaf to the objects of C. So every object gets what kind of attributes you want there, say strings uh, for both of them, say. So T of employee is string and T of department is string here. And now using the canonical cofunctor from C to ob C. Now for functors, there's a functor from ob C to C, but for cofunctors, there's a functor from C to ob C because it, it's canonical because this thing only has identities in it and they need to be preserved going back up. So anyway, using this canonical cofunctor and T downstairs, the attribute assignment is this alpha two cell here. It just says that for every row um, in, in one of these tables, I need to assign an element of the um, attributes there. So we're using the full structure in some sense of, um, of P, the, the frame by category. Uh, and, and more of the structure is useful, namely um, not only these cofunctors and the two cells, but also the profunctors, the, the, the composition with um, 
arbitrary uh, horizontal maps are called, you might call them data migration functors. So what is one? I, st I told you last time that I would give you more about the semantics of a pro functor when we got to applications and here we are. So if we have a, a CD by module, then first of all, it's just a functor from C to one D by modules. So since we all understand functors pretty well, uh, it's enough for me to tell you what one D by modules are. And an object in one D by modules is a formal coproduct of formal limits in D. Now a formal limit in D is called a conjunctive query in databases. Um, I guess those would probably be the finite limits, but uh, it's not a big deal, I don't think. So a pro functor from one to D is a disjoint union of conjunctive queries, which is like kind of the most important thing that you'll find in database theory. So I'll call these duck queries, just so I don't say disjoint union of conjunctive queries, DUC queries. So a one D by module is just a duck query on D. What's an example? If D is this category, uh, city maps to state and county maps to state, a duck query might be something like, give me all pairs of cities in the same state, plus all cities and counties in the same state, plus all pairs of counties in the same state. That's a disjoint union of conjunctive queries. And a CD by module migrates data from D to C by taking all the data you have in C, some D set, and composing with P to get a C set, and what it'll do is it'll just kind of, for every object in C, it'll, it'll take a duck query on, on D. So just as an organized system of, of disjoint unions of duck queries on D. So that kind of finishes the database stuff. Let's go to cellular automata. Cellular automata are like wired together more machines. Each of these could be like a more machine, except that, um, except that there's no internal state of the more machine. What you see is what you get. So there's nothing behind this black square. And so cellular automata uh, come up in, for example, Conway's Game of Life. So if you've ever seen that thing, it's a bunch of white and black squares and you have things called gliders and they move down the screen. And what do I mean that they move? What I mean is, uh, and what do I mean by screen? <laughs> so the Game of Life takes place on a grid. It could be any grid but, or any graph really. But for, for right now, let's say that the vertices of that graph are the um, pairs of integers. And um, each square has some neighbors. So you have some edges or arrows. Uh, and, and so you have a graph. And then each square can be one of, in one of two states. We'll eventually call those colors white or black. Uh, and and th that's also something you can change. You can make that any set of colors. And the, set, the state at any, uh, any square needs some update rule. And so in Game of Life, the update rule is this. It says that if the square is black and has two or three black neighbors, it stays black. Whereas if it's white and has three black neighbors, it turns black. And finally, any other situation turns white. So here we have a black square. It only has one black neighbor, so it turns white. Whereas this black square has three black neighbors, so it remains black. This white square has too many black neighbors, it has five, so it remains white. Whereas uh, this, black, this white square has three black neighbors, so it turns black. And that's the rule. And from that, you get these gliders moving across the screen and you get arbitrary, it's Turing complete. You get, uh, you can count primes. It's, it's pretty amazing to see what people make with this thing. So how do we encode this in P? Well, we encode the graph as a pro functor or a bimodule from VY to VY. VY is the discrete category on V. And uh, if we think of this as a database query, it's just that every vertex is querying its neighbors. Uh, so um, in the case of the grid, every square had nine neighbors. And so the pro functor for the game of life was VY to the nine. And I, again, I really like about poly that, that inside of G, G is VY to the nine. And you can real, the notation really helps you, uh, really gives you um, a lot of you know, intuition or it reminds you what you're talking about in the sense that the nineness of the neighbors, that you have nine neighbors, including yourself, is represented right in the polynomial sitting here. And all this is, is just a polynomial mapping to a composite and to another composite. Now this G, because um, it's fairly simple, uh, it, doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have any extra sums here. It's actually a pro functor, uh, meaning it preserves the terminal object. Um, so G of V is V. That's gonna come in 
handy in a second. Okay, so what we're saying is that this any graph can re be represented as a prof functor. And uh, let's see what else we got to say. So to talk about the color set for every node, we just need to give for every vertex what colors it's allowed. And you could do different colors for different nodes, but let's just say that C is 2V. In other words, uh, the functor, the map here is going to be just projection onto the V. And so what we're saying is every vertex gets two colors. And then finally, the update formula with the kind of crazy, uh, if you're black and you have three black neighbors or two black neighbors, you turn black or all that sort of stuff. That's just a map of prof functors. So it says for every vertex, query your neighbors, ask them the, their colors, and the update must give you a new color for that vertex. So it's just a natural transformation. It's just a morphism um, in, in uh, just a two cell here. And then finally, um, given an initial color setup. So what you do in the game of life is you started off in some situation, you, you started off by er giving every vertex a color. And, uh, and um, so to give every vertex a color is to map V, the terminal VY uh, coalgebra to C. Um, okay, um, that's that there. And then we can iteratively, iteratively run the cellular automata, which I'll show you on the next page uh, in this kind of crazy looking diagram here. So I, I drew in gray the fact that when I take V mapping to C, when I take V and compose it with these profunctors G, uh, we get V again. So V, 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 we just get the terminal object every time. But on the bottom is where the interesting stuff is happening. We get this update. Now we have Z zero to VY, the color set again, update and update. And what you get is uh, you get your original color set and then you get your, your next step and your next step and your next step. So this kind of, I don't know, is it a flame? I don't know what sort of picture this is, but um, this thing here, uh, um, is running the cellular automaton. And the last, I hope I'm not too, I guess I'm going pretty fast. Uh, so we might have a nice long, what is it, that uh, beer break. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what deep learning is, or roughly, so everyone's probably heard of this phenomenon. Uh, in a paper called Backprop as Functors, um, Brendan and uh, Brendan Fong and I and, and Remy Tuyeras uh, showed how um, how this is expressed in terms of symmetric monoidal categories. Roughly speaking, deep learning is you set up a bunch of neurons into a big pattern, um, a kind of string diagram, and then each neuron you um, is supposed to learn a function. And by learning, how do you teach it? You teach it by giving it training data. And what's training data? It's input output pairs. So if you want to learn a function like y equals x squared, you could give it 0, 0, and 1, 1, and 2, 4, and 3, 9, and say learn, and it would try to learn. Um, so how does it learn, or what's going on here? The objects, so what I'm telling you is that these neurons, uh, these learning machines, uh, can be strung together in symmetric monoidal category like diagrams. So the objects in learn, let's say, or the objects that take place in deep learning, I guess are usually uh, Euclidean spaces, Rn, and we're gonna use monoidal product of times. Um, and a learner from Rm to Rn, something that learns a function from Rm to Rn, well, it can't learn an arbitrary function. It can only, I mean, you can give it an arbitrary function, but all it knows how to do is run through some parameter space. So you assign up front, in order to give a morphism, you must tell me what parameter space you're going to use. Um, the, the parameter space is usually called the weights and biases of your learner. It's kind of, uh, um, well, it's not too important. So you give a parameter space. In order to give a morphism, you give a parameter space. You give a function that says for any parameter, what function from Rm to Rn is it? So we kind of implement that parameterized uh, function. And then this update uh, map, that takes a parameter, your current best guess of where you, where you, what function you're supposed to be learning, and a training pair of an input and an output. So the trainer gives you an input and output, and you return a new parameter, and you that's the update. But you also back propagate a new uh, like a, a new input. So they give you this output, and you they give you this training pair. You update your parameter, and you back propagate something backwards towards your input side. Now, 
without this RM part, if you only, if you delete this factor, you wouldn't be able to compose these morphisms. These would not be morphisms in a monoidal category if you only updated, because when you try to compose them, you wouldn't, if you had a training pair on the composite, you wouldn't be able to get a training pair on the, on the first uh, of your two maps. So you can't define composition without this second part. Now, typically uh, in deep learning, I and U will have very particular forms. I will usually be a composite of linear maps and logistic-like maps, like maps that are zero to left of zero or something like that. Um, and U, the updating thing, is usually gradient descent along something they call a loss uh, covector, a loss function. So if I gave you um, in Rn, if I gave you some kind of, um, uh, if, if given Rp and Rm, I gave you some kind of cotangent vector, you would be able to move it back along this thing to give a cotangent vector in Rm and R, Rp. And so that's kind of, it, typically they have this very particular form, but, but um, in terms of just, um, so yeah, it uses calculus in, in all the best known methods, but the structure here at least um, is set theoretic. So a learner, if I have set A and B and I'm trying to learn a function from A to B, what do I need? I need a parameter set P. I need a function from P times A to B, a parameterized function from A to B. And I need an update from P times A to times B to P times A. But we can see that in poly, it's exactly the co-algebras of this internal HOM. So back on the first day, I told you that tensor had an internal HOM and I gave you the formula for it. Um, so a y to the a, that is the, um, that is the co-monad you get from, well, we're not gonna use the co-monad structure, but it's, it's, if you do currying, that's the co-monad you get, and there's the co-monad you get from B, um, but whatever. Uh, the point is this internal HOM has this formula. What is a, a position in this polynomial? It's a function from AY to the A to BY to the B, and a direction is a pair AB. So what we're saying is that um, a dynamical system in here, or a, a co-algebra, would have a bunch of states, a p say, and every p parameter or state would be assigned, um, first of all, a way to go from a to b, and second of all, a way from, to go from a and b, an input and an output, to get a new a as your back propagation. And then given an a, b input, uh, input output pair, you would also get a new element of p. So what we're seeing is that learners, in the sense of uh, my paper with Brendan and Remy, uh, are exactly co-algebras on this internal HOM thing. And so th these include all of the, the typical calculus-based learners. Now for any polynomial P, the category of co-algebras forms a topos, uh, a co sheaf topos, um, namely the CP sets, the functors from the terminal co-algebra to set. And and since CP is free on a graph, CP set is about as easy as toposes get. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a co sheaf category where the, the site is a graph. But in particular, that means that P coalgebras uh, has an internal type theory and logic. Um, the Joyal's Kripke semantics allows us to write down logical formulas and understand um, what they mean in terms of P coalgebras. So it, they describe constraints on dynamical systems or on P coalgebras. Um, a proposition in this logic is just any subobject of the terminal coalgebra, meaning it's a set of P trees. A P tree is a tree, possibly infinite, where every node is labeled by a, um, by a position in P and branches like the directions there. And a, a logical proposition is just a set of P trees that are closed under taking subtrees. So you, you, you take your tree, you look at any node and you look at the subtree there, that should also be in phi. And so gradient descent and back propagation is just one particular proposition in this topos. It's the proposition that, that says, I use gradient descent and I, I'm smooth and things like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very particular kind. So gradient, uh, machine learning actually, when you have a data scientist, Usually that person does things like run this thing for a while, and then if it gets stuck in a, in a well, uh, change something and you know, do a bunch of stuff. Well, if we take what that data scientist is doing, um, we may, it, 
if they if they are doing anything kind of algorithmic, even if they're watching it for 20 time steps or anything between 20 and 40 time steps and then making an update, whatever it is they're doing, as long as as long as they always do that, that will be a proposition. So we can like real machine learning, including the data scientist itself, uh, which is a very important part of machine learning, um, would be a proposition here. So um, okay, so that's that concludes my tutorial. Basically, I'm just saying that poly is a really neat, cool category that I love. It's completely combinatorial. The calculations are concrete and it's already familiar. Um, like you have these formulas that just make me feel like I'm in middle school again. Uh, it's theoretically beautiful. The comonoids are categories. The co-algebras are co-presheaves. And it's got this wide scope of applications from database and data migrations, dynamical systems and cellular automata and deep learning and generalizations. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, David. There were two very nice talks. So I um, have my hands on the behalf of everybody. Um, so uh, time for questions or comments. So Frederic made a comment and a question. Maybe you want to uh, speak? So do I need to unmute or ask to I was usually taking the uh, unmuting everybody, uh, allowing everyone to unmute. Yeah, good, yeah, good. Okay, I found out how to unmute myself. Yeah, I was just going to, uh, about this example on deep learning, I was, uh, because deep, uh, deep learning systems are famously opaque, you don't know why they're taking the decisions they do. I was wondering if you could think of this a very large parameter space that they work with and find a way to break it down into smaller matrices, which in a sense are mode dependent dynamical systems. And uh, which in a sense would make the deep learning system less opaque because you could sort of find out by identifying which sub matrices it use, uh, it could sort of tell you why it made that decision. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it roughly makes sense. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's passed the plausibility test. Um, I would, it sounds like you may have thought about this more than me, so I would like to maybe talk offline about it, but um, if you're talking about somehow having these things learn their uh, connections, like different connection patterns or things like that, or... Um, uh, no, not really. I was thinking that in pre-training, you would actually okay. have, you would identify typical subsystems or sub-matrices, and then you could get the system to justify why it made a decision because it was it it updated weights in particular sub matrices which it learned from pre-learning from pre-training okay yeah i i don't know um it's an interesting question uh i'll have to think about it or maybe we can okay. if you send me an email it'd be interesting to talk more if, especially if you if you uh yeah. if it seems plausible to you and that, that's certainly interesting yeah okay thank you thanks okay. so richard He needs to unmute somehow. Ah, sorry. Um, yeah, that's it. That's good. Thank you. Um, thanks, David. Um, this question is basically orthogonal to the, the actual talk. But in this deep learning thing, when you do this, uh, uh, you have this presentation of the update. So what, in practice, does the updated RM look like? Is it just the same as the input RM, or what do you do? Uh, in practice, you you pass back a gradient vector. You pass back. Uh, um, you take the you take some input p. You take some input here and here. You get an output. They give you some loss function. They say, "Oh, that was bad." You know, they, they, and you take the uh, the cotangent vector there and you pass it back to these two. Right, so normally you just do that for RP, but you're saying you do it for the whole input space. So I, I, You do it for I RM whole... also, yeah, in order to pass that back to the previous neuron. Okay, all right, so you are providing, I mean, you pass some way towards along your gradient, depending on like the speed that you're doing. Yeah, they do, they do black magic there because they, they um, well, they use, I guess, the Riemannian structure too, and they pick some, I think they call it a learning rate, which, 
how how far to go along that uh, vector. Right. I mean, that's the main sort of magic, right? But yeah. right. So the point is, you're saying that I'm not just going to update the parameter space. I'm going to also update in exactly the same way the input space. That's right. Okay. Which, if you do it in practice, I mean, that does something terrible, right? If you just try and update the input space, then. Uh, oh no! You pass that back. You don't. Sorry, you don't update the input space. You send back a new training pair to the previous okay. neuron. The previous neuron had an input to itself, but it didn't have an output to itself. It didn't yeah. know what it should train on, and you pass back uh, the loss vector or the uh, or pass that back to the previous thing. Right. And what if you just pass back the input unchanged? So the RM parameter is just. I just project the RM I got as input as the then output. only the last neuron would be learning. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, Torsten. Oops. Oh yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, especially, I mean, I quite liked the, the application uh, part. I just wondered. Um, about these uh, automata you mentioned, uh, are you aware of 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 uh, Huvan, uh, of, of Hancock and Huvan, uh, who, who used uh, polynomial uh, polynomial functors to describe uh, interacting systems? Uh, no. Would you uh, tell me the, the reference? Yes, I already posted in an archive uh, in the in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, any other? Uh, Luis Alberto Gomez, would you like to ask your question yourself or should I read it out? Well, I can read it. Ah, sorry, no microphone. Okay, so here's the question. How does the topology of the graph of a wiring diagram affect the diagram with respect to morphisms in poly? Um, how does, let's see. Can you ask that question again? Uh, the topology of the graph. How does, how does it affect, affect the diagram with respect to morphisms in poly? Yeah, so um, this picture here, hmm trying to think of a way to say this easily enough. Um, the topology of this, this graph here, I, by which I think you mean the, the connection pattern, uh, is exactly what you need to define this map from P1 tensor P2 tensor P5 to Q. Um, so let's say uh, you had A Y to the B and B Y to the C you you would need a you would get a map from that tensor to a y to the c and so uh, there is a very particular one I, I don't exactly know how to answer the question except to say that that the wiring pattern here is, is sufficient to tell you what map you need here and if I've written this down more carefully um, other places but um, I'm happy if if that person sends me an email to to describe it in more detail. Okay, thanks. Sure. And then I think we have time for a question from Paul, please. Yeah, so there's, I, there's some interesting theory and some very novel applications about this um, in the younger generation. Um, I just wanted, firstly, to ask a stupid question. Secondly, to say something from, from a previous generation. The stupid question is, what are the morphisms of poly? Are they... Are they just natural transformations, or are they ones of um, which are uh, which are pullback squares? Uh, natural transformations. Right. Okay. I call them Cartesian if they're pullback squares. Yes. Okay. I I was wondering what the emphasis was in the in the current work. Okay. So um, uh, your you, so your your polynomial functors they 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 preserve connected limits and they have multi adjoints and so on. Um, now, um, when Francois Lamarche and I were working on this 30 years ago, um, we were interested in more general things where you could, you could divide the terms of your polynomial by a, by a, um, a, a permutation group. 
Uh -huh. so if you imagine, if you imagine a Taylor series, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, each term is divided by something, so you can divide uh, by divide your monomials by a permutation group action. Um, and then the functors preserve wide pullbacks rather than um, they don't. They they no longer preserve equalizers. Um, so I wonder um, whether whether this generalization can fit into the various theory that you've got, not just you, but for the other participants, um, and whether you have any use for it in in your novel applications. Um, I guess does that allow you to do multi sets and things like that rather than lists? Um, yes, I think yes, that's right. Yes, right. Yeah. So that I mean that's that's a nice thing. Uh, I I don't know where I would use it in any of the things I've talked about today. I mean, obviously yeah. I chose them because I do know how to do them without uh, uh, quotients by symmetric groups and things. But um, but but I wouldn't be surprised if if it would come up. A certain okay. Well, some of, some of the other uh, some of the other participants working in other applications. Or other theory might, um, might make use of that. Okay. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Okay. Um, then uh, thanks again, David. That was very nice and useful. Um, and I think we should move on um, to hear what Richard has to say today. Are you ready, Richard? Uh, we don't want to hear Richard today, but you can make some gestures. <laughs> All right, how's that? Thank you. Um, okay, let me try and share my screen and see what happens today. Looks good. Looks good. Um, okay. Nearly ready. Yes, please. All right. I think I'm good to go. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Um, and hello again, everyone. So I'm just going to kind of continue from where I left off last time, but maybe I'll just remind you of the key plot points that we saw last time. So we were looking at, well, we started by looking at what polynomial functors uh, on set are between powers of set or more generally between slices of set. And then uh, we described various different views on polynomial functors on set. And in particular, you had these two different views they're composites of the, the delta f's, pullback functors, the left adjoints, the um, post-composition functors, and the right adjoints, the dependent products like this. And we spent some time showing that any such composite of functors could be reduced to one like this. But the point is that this reduction could be done not only in uh, for functors between slices of set, but for functors between slices of any category E with pullback of this, with pullbacks, functors of this form. And so uh, here was the idea. So it's basically, you wanna rewrite any composite of sigmas, pi's and deltas as a delta followed by a pi followed by a sigma. And so you basically just show that if I've got a sigma followed by a delta, I've got a way of writing as a delta followed by a sigma by forming a pullback. Uh, similarly, if I've got a pi followed by a delta, then again, I can form a pullback and then I can use that to rewrite it as a delta followed by a pi. And finally, if I've got a, a sigma followed by a pi, then I can rewrite that in a certain way. So here's a sigma followed by a pi. I can rewrite it as a delta followed by a pi followed by a sigma. And the way we do that is we take our, uh, our map that we are sigmaing along and then the map that we're pieing along and then we form this diagram here. So I take pi g of f, then the pullback, and then this map epsilon here, which is the co-unit of this adjunction here at the object f. 
And I'm just going to put a star in here, but I'm going to note that this is what various people have called already a distributivity pullback. Okay, so that term's due to Mark Weber and it's in this paper, polynomials in categories with pullbacks. Okay. All right, and so again, that's the final sort of rewrite step here. And using that, I can rewrite any composite of red, green, and black arrows in this form. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, I'm just going to kind of continue on. I might as well, I suppose. So this is like talk two. And it happens to coincide with section two. So what I talked about last time was what I called the operational view or the extensive view. And I guess what I'm going to talk about today is the combinatorial view. Or I suppose you might call it the intensive view. I'm not really sure why you call it the intensive view, except I called the other one the extensive view. So, I mean, what else could I call it, really? Um, but the point is this, right? So the normal form um, of a polynomial functor from e to the i into e to the j, which is black followed by red followed by green, um, gives us a more compact way of viewing them. So I mean, a more compact way of viewing them. Okay, so, and then this is the definition that we've seen multiple times, but I'm just going to spell it out very explicitly once and for all. So a polynomial in a category with pullbacks, E, is a diagram like this. It's a diagram with three arrows. So, so, so this is a polynomial from i to j. And okay, with pullbacks, a diagram like this. So I've got an i, I've got a map here, which I seem to be calling t. Then I've got a map across here, which is p. And then we've got a map down here called uh, s. Okay. And so the point of this, so if I call this diagram uh, P, then the associated polynomial functor of P is FP, which is defined to be, I start in E over I. I do a delta t, taking me into E over E. Uh, then I do a pi p, taking me into E over B. And then I run out of space. And then finally, I do a sigma s, taking me into E over J. OK? All right. And so the point is that uh, this diagram captures all possible polynomial functors, at least within isomorphism. And that's kind of what we particularly care about at the moment. OK. All right. And so if we want to compose two polynomials, well, we'd like the composite of two polynomials. We want to define what we mean by the composite of two polynomials. It should just mean the composite of the associated polynomial functors. Now, the associated polynomial functors are in normal form. And if I compose those together, I just do FP followed by FQ. Then the thing I get is no longer in normal form. So I have to normalize it. And I know how to normalize it. And if I follow that normalization algorithm, I get this pretty picture that um, we saw in David's talk, at least. 
Okay. So to compose two polynomials, we compose their associated polynomial functors and take the normal form. Okay. So what does that mean in practice? So suppose I've got I, E, B, J. And so composition looks like this, F, C, J, F, C, K. And then I've got some maps here. So this is like, uh, maybe I don't even need to give my maps names. I don't think I need to give my maps names, but I definitely need to create more space. Let's do this. Okay, so I just need to get the colors right, basically. So I got this picture here, right? So I do the composite function is delta pi sigma, delta pi sigma. And now I need to arrange that so that I get a delta followed by a pi followed by a sigma, all told. And so I just start, well, look, I've got a, here's a green followed by a, a, a black. So I need to rearrange that to get a, a black followed by a green. Uh, and so I just take a pullback because that's, that's the step in computing the normal form. I take a pullback. So I take a pullback here, get some object. Okay. And now I know that doing sigma delta is the same as doing delta sigma because that was one of my normalization rules. Okay, so that's just a pullback. Right, so then now the next thing I can I can do is rewrite this uh, uh, this sigma followed by a pi as a delta followed by a pi followed by a sigma. Okay, and to do that we had a clear sort of uh, methodology for doing that, which is to form one of these distributivity pullbacks. So if I do that, then I get something like this. And then I take a pullback and I get some induced map here. Okay, so that's a distributivity pullback. Okay, so now I know that doing this is the same as doing this. So now I do a delta pi sigma sigma. Okay. All right, and the final thing that's wrong is that this pi is followed by a big delta. And so I just rewrite it so that it becomes a uh, a delta followed by a pi, and I do that just by taking a pullback. Or I could re equally well take a pair of pullbacks, because I mean, that is in the end what I want to do. So I want to pull back and pull back like that. Okay, and so in the end, just for my normalization rules, I know that doing that is the same as doing that, the same as doing that, the same as doing that. Hey, presto, this is the form that we want. So our final polynomial composite has this down the left, this across the top, and this down the right. Okay. All right, good. So there you go. You now have to compose uh, polynomials now. So this, this is P. Uh, I guess this is like... Let's try and... I'm fighting the bottom of the page here, but I'm just going to try and uh, get everything on one page. So this here is P, this here is Q, and then this by definition is Q composed with P. And by construction, uh, the functor associated to com Q composed with P is isomorphic to the functor composed associated to Q composed with the functor associated to P. All right. Okay, good. So there you go. That's why you draw these, uh, these funny diagrams when you're trying to compose polynomials, you're just implementing your normal form algorithm. All right. So, so far, we've talked about polynomials um, in their two guises as functors between slices and as these funny diagrams. And so you might want to get a category of polynomials, but unfortunately it doesn't quite work because your composition turns out not to be associative. 
but it is associative up to isomorphism where I have to say what isomorphism means. And if I want to say what isomorphism means, then it basically means I should have a bicategory rather than just a category. And if I'm going to have a bicategory rather than a category, then um, I really have to investigate what the correct notion of two cell should be in this bicategory. Okay, so we're more or less forced to ask if I've got two polynomials from I to J, what's an appropriate notion of map between them? Okay, so I guess we better investigate that maps of polynomials. We'd like to see polynomials from I to J as maps or one cells in an appropriate bicategory, in a bicategory, um, poly sub E. Okay. Um, Maybe I'll call it poly obby when no, no, that's fine. I'll keep it like that. All right, so we want to see them as one cells in a bicategory. So then the obvious question is, what are the two cells? Well, to motivate it, I guess we're going to go back to the set case. Okay, to motivate this. Let's return to the set case. So I guess uh, David has discussed a little bit what happens with, so his polynomials are, are these polynomials from one to one? I mean, largely, I mean, not exclusively, but to a large extent, David was looking at polynomials where I and J are both one. So I just have an arrow E to B. And in that context, there's a good notion of map from one such polynomial to another. And I guess I just want to explain how that generalizes to the case where I've got a map between two polynomials from I to J. And well, we're just going to look at the corresponding polynomial functors and look at natural transformations between them. So suppose that um, F and G from a set to the i into set to the j are polynomial functors. Then a map between them is just a natural transformation. It's just a natural transformation. OK, now the point is. So since um, polynomial functors preserve connected limits, so in set, I mean, always actually, limits. But I mean, I guess we're talking about in set, so maybe I'll say in set. Preserve connected limits. So special fact about set, a connected limit preserving functor into set is just a co-product of representables. Okay, so I guess this goes back to Dier, and I mean another paper that's often mentioned in this uh, aspect is the Carboni Johnston paper on um, familiarly representable functors, which are basically the same thing. So anyway, so a polynomial functor between slices of set preserves connected limits. Um, they are point-wise co-products of representables and so we can use Yoneda to get a representation of uh, of natural transformations of such natural transformations in terms of the um, polynomial normal form. 
Okay. Mike Johnson's thesis as well. There you go. Mike Johnson has some fun stuff in his PhD thesis. In particular, he's got, um, I think he has the result that uh, the free category monad is a parametric right adjoint monad on the uh, category of directed graphs, which is quite nice. Um, all right, so what am I talking about? I'm trying to prove to you that this is the case. So proposition. So if uh, P and Q are set polynomials, so again, this is in terms of the representing data, so from I to J, so we've got something like this, here we've got I, J, E, B, F, C, and so I've got these maps here. Okay, so P is on the top and Q is on the bottom, but P, Q. Then um, alf to give, or let's say then to give alpha from F of P to F of Q is equally to give the following. So map F and a map G. So the blue maps F and G above. Okay, so what's happening here? So F is just a map from B to C. I then form a chosen pullback square here. So that these data are uh, determined by that chose choice of pullbacks. And then from that pullback object, I give a map G here and everything in sight commutes. So F commutes with those two maps. G makes this triangle commute and also makes this square here commute, okay? Okay, so I'm just gonna try and convince you of this by showing you the, the Unader argument that, that does this. And so let's, uh, let's do that. This is possibly more detail than you want, but um, Torsten's been saying he finds the type theoretic version much more readable. So I'm gonna give you the type theoretic version and hopefully at least Torsten will be, uh, will be happy. So, I mean, this is in a sense, the only real way you can do this, I think. So it's not a matter of readability, it's a matter of how the hell do you do this? And I think this is the way you do it basically. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll give my map some names just for, just for fun. So I've got T, uh, and let's call it uh, STU. And then here I've got uh, P and Q. Uh, here I've got S and V, I suppose. All right. So here we go. So let's write, so I'm gonna think, so this this diagram, this this uh, this bridge diagram, I'm gonna kind of break some of it up into families of sets. So we write um, B, J, J and J for the family of fibers of S. And we write, so E, I'm going to write E, I, B, for I in I, B in B, for the fibers of uh, this map to the left. Um, I guess that's the pair T comma P uh, from E to I times B. Okay. All right. And so they were sort of vaguely, you've heard people talk about two-sided discrete vibration, discrete vibration when talking about parametric right thing, right adjoint things. And so somehow that's the that's the uh, 
the kind of breakup we're doing here. We're seeing this is fibered over this, and then this is fibered over that pair. Now, if you do that, then in these terms, if I write out my uh, functor FP, and I'm going to just do this as something between slices for the moment. Uh, sorry, not slices, between um, powers of set. OK, so I take an indexed family of sets here, which is like xi for i and i, and I'm going to send it to what? Well, let me just write down what happens. So I take the sum over b in bj. So in the end, I'm getting a family indexed by j and j. So I need to tell you what the elements of that family are. And it's going to be a sum of some monomials. OK? And so my, mon my monomials will be kind of x sub i raised to some power multiplied together over the various i. So I get product over i in i, x sub i to the power of e i b. OK? So that's what this polynomial functor actually looks like. OK? So now alpha is something like this. So it's a natural transformation, and I'm going to slowly transform it. So sum over b and bj, product over i and i, x. Well, I mean, maybe I don't even need to write the x, right? So that's its value at some set, set family of sets. So I'm, I'll write blank sub i, i th projection raised to the power eib. And then it's a natural transformation from there into the same thing for the c's. So c in cj product over i in i blank sub i to the e i c. OK, and it's a family of such things indexed by j and j, right? So that's transformation between functors into set to the j. And that's just the same as a j index family of natural transformations between the components. OK, so it's just a bunch of natural transformations like that. And let's just transform that repeatedly. So that's the same as, well, there's a sum on the left. So I can use the universal property of coproduct. So that's just the same as a bunch of natural transformations like this. So let's call this alpha sub, I guess, J B into just the same thing as before. OK. All right, and so this is for J in J, B in B of J. OK, so what's this? Well, the thing is, <clears throat> so now we're looking each each of these things. So this is a functor from set to the i to set, right? And so is this. Point is, this is a representable functor from set to the i to set. OK, so this is, I mean, this this bit here. That's actually representable. From set to the i to the set. And it's represented by the family uh, E, I, B for i and i. OK, remember B is a fixed thing here. Well, that's good because I can apply the unit dilemma. So by Yoneda, this is the same as giving a family of elements, which I guess will be alpha j b applied to the family of identity maps here. So like lambda i dot 1. And so I could define this to be alpha twiddle j b. And that's an element of the right-hand side here evaluated at this representing object. So that's in sum c in c j product i in i of um, E, I, B to the, oh, seems there's something wrong here. These E should all be Fs, I guess. Uh, oh, no, that one's OK. 
This one is not okay, and this one is not okay. That should be an F. It should be an F. And so this is F to the IC. Okay, nearly there. So this is a bunch of elements. So if we write um, alpha twiddle JB as, well, it's a pair of some element in CJ. And I'm going to write that as F of uh, F of B in CJ. And then my second thing is a map, which I'm going to write as G sub JB. And that's a map from, if you look at it, um, well, it's a family of maps, right? And so I'm going to kind of take those individually. So it's, it's for each I, I give a map from FIC to EIB. So I can view that as a family of maps, which I'm going to call um, G sub something or other, G sub I B going from F I comma F of B into E I comma B. And this is for each I in I. Then we get, and what we get is exactly this, this thing here. So let's copy it and then check that it is indeed what we've got. All right, let's have a look. So B is in BJ. So the first thing I have is an element F of B in CJ. So that says I've got an F here making this triangle commute because it meant BJ, the fiber over J, to CJ, the fiber over J, okay? So that's that. And then the other thing is this map G. Okay, now if we look at the elements in here, which project down to little i in here, and which project down to little b in here, what's that the same as? Well, it's the same as giving an element in here and an element in here that map down to the same thing in here. And I've, I mean, I know it maps a little b in here, so it must map to f of little b in here. And so the elements in here, which lie also over little i in here, comprise this set here. And each such element is mapped to something in here that maps over, lives over little i in here and over b in here, which is eib. So this family of maps gib, uh, when I stick them together, over all i and all b, give me a map g like that, OK? OK, so I was going to wimp out and just do you the, the case from one to one, but um, I changed my mind. And maybe you're now regretting that I changed my mind. But I just wanted to actually give you a proper proof that this, this kind of works, OK? OK, that's good. So in set. We have this representation of these natural transformations as these as these functors, and that's all well and good. So what happens in an arbitrary category E? With pullbacks. Well, <clears throat> well, the naive thing doesn't work. Doesn't work. If we define a map of polys, a map between polys polys from I to J to be um, a natural transformation between their extents, between PF and PG, we get nowhere. And so, I mean, the reason for this is um, so the reason is 
that um, the PFs are no longer pointwise sums of representables. So we can't apply the Yoneda lemma. And in general, it's sort of uh, completely unclear what these general natural transformations would be. OK, and this is where the little remark I made at the end of last time comes in. So I said last time that we can view polyfunctors from E over I to E over J as index functors. Over E. And now uh, as index functors. Um, they are pointwise co-products of representables. And so the same argument, same argument applies. Applies. OK, I say same. Yeah, yeah, so this is not indexed over set, it's indexed over E. Yes, I should have been clear about that last time. But yeah, you view, it's important you view everything as indexed over E itself, because I mean, I mean, E over I is, as a vibration over, over E is kind of a representable, right? And I mean, that's not that's not what this E over I is. It's an index slice category, but somehow that should at least draw the link between why you want to view it as indexed over E. Okay. Now I say it's the same argument. In fact, the argument is quite intricate. So I guess it was done by Abbott in, um, in his PhD thesis. And then that was in a special case where I and J are just discrete, basically just co-products of one. And then there's a general version in the Gambino Cock paper. All right, so um, let's summarize that. So what we have is the following. So first of all, what do I mean by a map? of polys from I to J in E is this thing again. OK, so that, we make that definition. That's all I'm going to make so far. And then the proposition is the following. So there's an assignment between maps of polys from I to J. So if I write poly E I J P Q for the set of such. OK, so there's an assignment PQ to, um, I guess, index natural transformations um, between the associated polynomial functors FP, FQ. OK, so I look at the index natural transformations between these associated polynomial functors, 
which sends a diagram like star to the following thing. OK, so how does this work? So remember what the polynomials become. So these become pi's here. And then uh, these become sigmas. And these things here uh, get turned around and become deltas. So I have a delta t, a delta u. All right, I'm trying to get a natural transformation from the top thing to the bottom thing. All right, and the way we do that is as follows. So, okay, um, this blue stuff I'm going to monkey around with until I get it into the, the form I need. So what I'm going to do is this is going to become a delta going up. So that will become a delta F. This will become a delta. I don't really care what it's delta of, but it becomes one. This is going to turn into a nice red map. So this is a pi of some kind. I'm not going to give that map a name. Um, and then this thing uh, on the left is apparently going to become a delta pointing down. Okay. Delta G. Okay. And so what happens is the following. So this, uh, I guess this left-hand square here is just the canonical isomorphism because, I mean, this square commutes. Oops. Oh, no. This square commutes, right? Uh -oh. This square this square commutes, and so this is the corresponding natural isomorphism between the pullback factors. Um, this commutes by Beck Chevalet because this square up here is a pullback. Uh, and then these two things are filled in with genuine natural transformations. And so I'll just tell you what these are, and you can figure out why they're that. This is the unit of delta G adjoint to pi G. And this is the co-unit of sigma f left adjoint to delta f. OK, so I have now, I hope, convinced you that uh, what I should really do is write e over everywhere here, right? And then it will become correct. Let's do that. e over j, e over b, e over c, e over f. OK, all right, so that you will agree if I paste all these two cells together, I can go from from here to I mean, I don't know, I go from here to here and I go from there to there and then I go from there to there and then I go from there to there. OK, so that gives me a natural transformation. And this is actually an isomorphism. So that is a function. And so, and so in that way, I can uh, provide a composition of these things, maps polynomials, because I got a composition of these things. OK, and so we get a category poly E i j, whose objects are the polynomials from i to j, and whose maps are these funny diagrams with a fully faithful functor um, poly e i j into um, indexed nat e over i e over j. OK? Is g assumed exponentiable? Uh, no, g is not assumed exponentiable. Um, G doesn't need to be exponentiable. Oh, I see. It seems like it does need to be exponentiable. I've got pi G right adjoint to delta G. Um, what's going on there? It's a good question. Don't know. I can't answer that immediately. Um, I mean, I think it's probably fine because I can basically take this commuting square here, and I get a commuting triangle of deltas, and then I transpose these two maps, and that gives me a, a two cell like this. 
So I mean, right. So in the end, I end up. I can use this if this exists, or I can use the units and k-units of the delta pi junctions for that map and that map. And I know those maps are both exponential because that one is by assumption and that one's a pullback of that. So okay, that's probably not the best way of saying it, but um, too late to change that now. All right, but thanks. That's a, a good point. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, right, so we got this, we get this category, and that's nice because on the face of it, composing these things doesn't look very easy, right? If I, if I got this and this, and then I go down to another one here, I mean, it's not terrible, but it's nice that I don't have to think at all. I, I just use this fact. All right, and so remember the point was to try and get a bicategory of polynomials, and so it appears that we've now defined the HOM categories of this bicategory. And that's exactly what we've done. And so, uh, so maybe just I should just ascribe this to someone. So, so like Abbott two thousand three, or Gambino Cock. Um, what's the year? Two thousand thirteen. Okay. And so finally, which is where I was hoping to get to, and it looks like I've just done it. So I can actually say definition. So first of all, there's something that's easy to define. I guess it's even the two category. of polynomial functors, polynomial functors, in E, has objects, those of E, uh, one cells, I to J, polynomial functors, uh, e over I to E over J, and two cells uh, indexed transformations alpha F to G from E over I to E over J. Okay, so this, I mean, this just works, right? There's nothing funny going on here. I mean, these are just functors and transformations and they compose just in exactly the normal way you'd expect them to. But the nice thing is, so given this previous result, um, <clears throat> so the bicategory of polynomial polynomials in E has objects, those of E, um, one cells uh, from I to J, uh, polynomials from I to J, and two cells these maps of polynomials and then I'm supposed to compose all these things together in various ways with remaining data um, obtained um, let's say remaining data forced by the requirement that, so this by category of polynomials, I'm calling poly sub E, that there be a locally fully faithful homomorphism of by categories
from poly E into index categories over E, which sends I to E over I and given on Homs by this thing poly E I J into index cat E, E over I, E over J, as in the previous proposition. Okay, so that is kind of uh, completely opaque. I mean, it's not completely opaque, right? I mean, there was some opacity because I never actually proved this proposition here. Now, if I had proven that proposition, then you could use it to unravel what in this bicategory of polynomials, what the composition of two cells, the, the vertical composition of two cells is, and what the horizontal composition of two cells is. We saw already what the composition of one cells is, right? It's just this, this polynomial composition. And um, all the other details would be amazingly fiddly to, um, to work out by hand. And in fact, if you look in gambino Cox, they basically do this argument here and thereby avoid the, the fiddling around. I mean, you can extract without too much difficulty what the, uh, what the horizontal and vertical composition are. But then if you wanted to prove by hand that you had a bicategory, so you want to get these coherence constraints and then check the pentagon axiom and so forth, then I think you would be in for a sort of very unpleasant time. And so this is a nice way of avoiding all those difficulties. Now, okay, so I'm just going to stop in about a minute, but I just want to say at the end of this, you might think this seems a bit unsatisfactory because, I mean, the one cells, that was quite a nice picture. For the two cells, there was sort of a reasonably nice picture, but there seemed to be a lot of fiddling around and uh, you might wonder if there's a better way. And so I guess my hope next time is to tell you about various universal properties of the poly construction, which will hopefully explain a bit better why you come to these definitions. All right, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Oh no, we don't clap hands because you speak one more time. It's like classical music. <laughs> um, I look. I look forward to see this uh, universal property because uh, I always felt this a little bit unsatisfactory too. Um, so, are there questions? Yes, we have Paul, and now we have the whole night for Paul's question. Ah, I need to unmute you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well. I don't know about the whole night. It's nearly midnight for me. Um, actually, I guess it's later for you, um, Joachim. Um, so a quick question. Uh, so if if you look at Cartesian transformations instead of natural ones, um, yep. does your diagram simplify? Yeah, yeah, I should have mentioned that. I I guess the the prevailing I, vibe in this workshop seems to be to non instead of the non-Cartesian ones. But if I do, then I just require this G to be invertible here. Yeah, I, I, that was my guess. Yeah, so I mean, then it's any then pullback to go rather than a chosen one, but yeah, so that's what I get. Yeah, well, that's that's much prettier, isn't it? Yeah, that's much prettier, I agree. Right, okay. Now, I this is such a long time ago, I cannot remember, and it's also too late at night, um, mm -hmm. but I had a, um, a factorization result. I call it the trace factorization because it, it was a generalization mm -hmm. of um, of stuff in Girard's domain theory. Right. Um, you might like to have a look and see whether there's some relationship between um, between your work and what I did. Right. So I mean, the trace the trace factorization, I think, is it, right. I mean, it's related to like the Dier notion of spectrum or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Probably, yes, but yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember. It's right. But, and again, off. yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, uh, again, that sort of goes in towards this, this parametric right adjoint world as well, this kind of way of presenting parametric right adjoints via kind of uh, 
an object and then a map out of a slice category in the other direction. So yeah, for sure, that's an important uh, view, I think. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Thorsten also raised his hand. Yes. Uh, um, I just I just wondered. Um, I mean, at least let's say in the in the set index, not the internal case. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that, that like I mean, what we have uh, this two category we have is basically a subcategory of cut, right? So so shouldn't uh, shouldn't this save us from having to prove these um, Pentagon laws uh, and uh, stuff like this? Oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm saying here, yeah, that's what I'm saying here is like, if I just define this by hand, yeah. then it's just going to be awful, right? But instead I say, uh, instead I say it's going to embed into like index categories over E, and therefore I can just take okay. the coherence here and transport it back to here, and then I don't have to do any work. Okay. So yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what I was uh, sort of suggesting at the end here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other, <clears throat> sorry, any other questions? Well, maybe it's enough for today then. And uh, then we can all go to bed well. Some of us. <laughs> okay, um, so I think we should just stop for today and um, see you tomorrow.